subcommittee will now come to order. Today, hackers and online thieves are giving new meaning to the phrase silent crime. It's my hope that we will join together, raise our voices, and, like actor Peter Finch in the movie Network, shout out the window, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take this anymore. Americans deserve nothing less. The chair now recognizes herself for an opening statement. Sophisticated cyber attacks are increasingly becoming the greatest threat to the future of electronic commerce here in the U.S. and around the world. That's why Congress must take immediate steps to better protect the personal online information of American consumers. It's time for us to declare war on identity theft and online fraud. The Secure and Fortify Electronic Data Act, which establishes uniform national standards for data security and data breach notification, is our opening shot. The Safe Data Act builds on legislation passed by the House in 2009 but never acted upon in the Senate. Most importantly, it reflects the changing landscape of data breaches and data security since that time. It's an upgraded 2.0 version of data security legislation, encompassing many of the lessons learned in the aftermath of massive data breaches at Sony and Epsilon, which put more than 100 million consumer accounts at risk, and those are just the ones that we know about. As subcommittee chairman, protection from identity theft and online fraud is one of my top priorities. Just last week, Citigroup, which has, one of, which has the world's largest financial services network, revealed a security breach in which hackers obtained personal information from hundreds of thousands of accounts. According to law enforcement officials, the hackers were able to gain access to, computer, uh, to customer names, account numbers, and contact information such as email addresses. Yesterday, we learned that an external website operated by the Oak Ridge nuclear weapons plant was victimized by a cyber attack, and earlier this week, the same group which claimed responsibility for attacks on Fox, PBS, and Sony also hacked the Senate's public website. In recent years, carefully orchestrated cyber attacks intended to obtain personal information about consumers, especially when it comes to their credit cards, have become one of the fastest growing criminal enterprises here in the United States and across the world. The FTC estimates that nearly 9 million Americans fall victim to identity theft every year, costing consumers and businesses billions of dollars annually. And the problem is only getting worse as these online attacks increase in frequency, sophistication, and boldness. As I have emphasized throughout our previous hearings, e-commerce is a vital and growing part of our economy. We should take steps to embrace and protect it, and that starts with robust cybersecurity. Most importantly, consumers have a right to know when their personal information has been compromised, and companies and organizations have an overriding responsibility to promptly alert uh, them. To that end, the Safe Data Act first requires companies and other entities that hold personal information to establish and maintain appropriate security policies to prevent unauthorized acquisition of the data. It also requires the notification of law enforcement within 48 hours after discovery of a breach, unless it was an accident or inadvertent and unlikely to result in harm. It requires companies and other entities to begin notifying consumers 48 hours after taking steps to prevent further breaches and determining who has to be notified. The Safe Data Act also gives the FTC authority over nonprofits for purposes of this act only. These organizations often possess a tremendous amount of consumer information, and they have been subjected to numerous breaches in the past. At the same time, we want to work with those affected, as well as with the FTC, to make sure any new regulations are not burdensome for small businesses, especially during these difficult economic times. In addition, we are granting the FTC authority to write rules that take into account the size and the nature of the data that is being held online. Clearly, there are obvious differences between information brokers and local retail businesses, and the rules should reflect those differences. The proposed legislation also requires all covered businesses to establish a data minimization plan providing for the elimination of consumers' personal data that is no longer necessary for business, uh, business purposes or for other legal obligations. And finally, the Safe Data Act preempts similar state laws to create uniform national standards for data security and data breach notification. We learned during our recent hearings that consumer notification is often hampered by the fact that companies must first determine their obligations under 47 different state regimes. At the end of the day, I believe this legislation will greatly benefit consumers, businesses, and the U.S. economy. Given the growing importance of e-commerce in nearly everything we do, we can no longer afford to sit back and do nothing. 
The time for action is now. And at this point, the uh, gentleman from, okay, and to inform people that we do have an overflow room in uh, 2123 for those standing who would prefer to be sitting again, 2123 is the overflow room. So at this point, I'd like to recognize uh, the gentleman from California, Mr. Waxman, for his opening statement. Thank you, um, Madam Chairman. Uh, I, I've said this at our previous hearing, and I want to repeat it today. Data security is not a partisan issue. It's something all of us should care about. Last year, there were over 597 data breaches that affected over 12.3 million records. Last Congress, this committee worked together to pass with bipartisan support a data security bill introduced by Representative Rush. Our bill passed the House in December of 2009 but the Senate never took it up, so it was not uh, completed. The bill we're considering today is based on our bipartisan House bill from the last Congress. It contains important provisions that require companies to uh, secure consumers' personal data and notify them in the case of breaches. And I commend uh, Chairman Bono Mack for using last year's bipartisan bill as a starting point. There are new provisions in the chair's draft that strengthen last Congress's bill. For example, the draft contains a potentially valuable new provision requiring companies to have plans to minimize personal data they retain on individuals. Unfortunately, there are some changes in the bill that I fear weaken uh, the bill rather than strengthen them strengthen it, and this is a mistake and one I hope we can fix as we consider this legislation. And let me raise some of the concerns I have. Under this legislation before us, Sony still would not have to notify its customers about its recent security breach. It did not restore the integrity of the data system for at least 43 days after Sony discovered the breach, and it still has not fully assessed the nature and scope of its breach. Notice is not required to the FTC and consumers under the draft until those steps have been completed. Well, that's far too long. It does little good to notify consumers after their identities have already been stolen and make them wait such a long period of time. This bill deletes key provisions on information brokers, which are companies that aggregate personal data about individuals and make a profit selling that personal information. It adds unnecessary burdens to the Federal Trade Commission's rulemaking process, making it more difficult for new pieces of data to be deemed, quote, personal. And there is significant ambiguity regarding the scope of personal information that a company is required to protect. Under this legislation, companies, including an aggregator of data, are exempted from the requirements to safeguard personal information any time that same data can be found in various local county government buildings. Furthermore, this draft creates an uneven playing field with potentially stronger data security and breach notification requirements for retailers than for non-bank financial institutions. There's no reason why financial institutions should be subject to smaller penalties for violations than retailers. So I look at it as a, not a, a balanced bill overall. It gives businesses too many protections and consumers not enough. It preempts st strong state laws and replaces them with a weak federal one. I hope these deficiencies in the bill can be fixed, and I want to work with uh, the, the chair to, and other members of this committee to pass as effective a bill as possible, and I'm looking forward to the uh, promised uh, stakeholder process. Uh, today's hearing will give us a chance to get further information about what a bill should and should not uh, have in, it, in its uh, details. We have a chance to pass meaningful legislation that actually could make a positive effect on everyone, and uh, we shouldn't pass up this opportunity. I look forward to working with you, Madam Chair. I thank the gentleman, and the chair now recognizes Mr. Stearns for two minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you very much for calling this hearing. Obviously, as pointed out by yourself and the ranking member, Mr. Waxman, this is very important that we try to get a bipartisan support for this. Uh, when I was chairman of this subcommittee, I introduced the Data Act in 2005, uh, six years ago, 
uh, established to protect authorized, unauthorized access to consumer data. Uh, this bill was co-sponsored by both sides. Uh, when we marked it up, it was reported out of the full committee by unanimous consent. Uh, obviously, I would have preferred that we started with my bill, which has a, uh, a, I think, a bipartisan support product of a broad understanding of the security issues uh, uh, back in 2005. Now we're working with possibly a slightly different focus bill, which could be good, um, that addresses the recent breaches that occurred both in Sony and Epsilon. Uh, I think we have to be concerned, and con not that we overreact uh, based upon those two cases. Uh, in both 2006 and 2009, there was bipartisan support uh, for the Data Act that I had. Uh, now we debate the uh, Safe Data Act, a bill that I'm concerned uh, has some very good points, uh, but also perhaps may go too far in some, some, other, some other areas. Obviously, I work with uh, the subcommittee, the chair lady, uh, to improve the bill uh, so it can pass as a bipartisan support like we've done in the past. Uh, so the committee and the full House uh, has an opportunity to vote on this. And so I look forward to the debate and I look forward to our witnesses. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, gentlemen. The chair recognizes Mr. Olson for one minute. I thank the chair for her tenacious leadership in bringing forward this draft bill. I think there's strong agreement that we need to move forward with federal data security legislation. Support for federal, federal legislation has been bipartisan. My colleague from Florida, Mr. Stearns, put forth a data security bill in the 109th Congress, which Mr. Rush introduced in the 110th and 111th Congresses. And now our chairwoman, Ms. Bono Mack, has put forth a bill in the 112th Congress. I appreciate all the efforts to help move us forward on this important issue. And I hope we can arrive at a truly bipartisan, balanced bill that protects consumers without putting unnecessary burdens on companies or hindering important uses of data. I look forward to continuing our discussion today and hope to be able to flesh out some issues that have been raised in testimony. I thank the chair and yield back my time. Thank the gentleman. And the chair recognizes Mr. Butterfield, uh, the ranking member of the subcommittee, for five minutes. I thank the chairman and apologize for being late. The only thing I can say is don't try going to Union Station at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday morning. <clears throat> uh, Madam Chairman, thank you for holding today's hearing on the Secure and Fortify Electronic Data Act. Uh, this bill includes some of the same provisions uh, that we saw in H.R. 2221, which passed the House and the 111th Congress. Uh, however, this draft also removes key consumer protection provisions that weaken the bill and make it less effective. Americans' embrace of technology has served as the impetus for rapid growth of online businesses and services. Uh, I can buy a car without ever seeing it in person. I can pay my bills uh, for one website, and I do it monthly. And I can even have all my data reside in a cloud so it is accessible from absolutely anywhere. In order for e-commerce to work, there must be data exchange between customer and businesses, uh, including names, addresses, social security numbers, uh, dates of birth, and so on. The ability to conduct business in an online space is an amazing convenience. Uh, no one I know could do without. <clears throat> but the failure of some of these businesses to protect their own network infrastructure and the information demanded of their customers has led to opening to an opening for a small but not insignificant group of criminals uh, to exploit and profit from the data these companies hold. And even those with strong security systems in place must be vigilant and adaptable to new threats. Uh, during the 109th Congress and subsequent Congresses, members of this committee worked in a bipartisan fashion to develop the Data Accountability and Trust Act to address the issue of data security. In the last Congress, my friend and former chairman of the committee, subcommittee, Mr. Rush, introduced the data bill, which ultimately passed the House, but the Senate uh, failed to act. That bill included special requirements for information brokers, including requiring brokers to submit security policies to the F FTC and requiring an annual audit of brokers' security practices, among other things. Uh, striking those key provisions from the bill significantly weakened the consumer protections it is supposed to provide. Further, the draft bill defines personal information to exclude information that is publicly available. In doing so, the bill gives the green light uh, to data aggregators to continue with business as usual without re being required to have any safeguards in place to protect the data. Madam Chairman, with over 2,500 data breaches having occurred since 2005, 
it is clear that the serious work of protecting consumers' data is something that has taken a back seat in Congress for too long. A federal standard <clears throat> is important. I say that again, a federal standard is important, and the Safe Data Act is a start. I am sorry we are not starting with the text that passed the House in the last Congress. Over the last few weeks, uh, over the next few weeks, Madam Chairman, I hope you will work with me and my staff uh, uh, to strengthen this draft bill. Together we can ensure consumer protections while allowing businesses the flexibility to adapt their policies and procedures in today's rapidly evolving information age. So thank you for having this hearing. I thank the Commissioner for her presence today. And I think I might reserve my time. I'm told that uh, the gentlelady from Illinois is coming. She is not here. I yield back. <clears throat> I think the gentleman just want to remind and, and reinforce to the entire panel that we intend fully on having a bipartisan product to the best of our ability, and uh, that will be our goal. So uh, now I'd like to turn our focus to the witness table. We have two panels today. On the first panel, we are honored to have uh, Honorable uh, Edith Ramirez, Commissioner at the FT FTC. Uh, thank you very much for being here today. You'll be recognized for five minutes to summarize your statement and just to, I'm sure you're familiar with the time clock. It's yellow, green, red kind of concept. When the light turns yellow, it means you have one minute to start your close. So at this point, we're happy to recognize you for your five-minute statement. Good morning. And please remember to turn your microphone on. Good morning. Chairman Bono Mack, Ranking Members Butterfield and Waxman, and members of the subcommittee, I am Edith Ramirez, a Commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to present the Commission's testimony on data security. I want to thank you, Chairman Bonomack, and the Committee for your leadership on this important issue. Before I continue, I'd like to note that my written testimony represents the views of the Federal Trade Commission, but my oral remarks and responses to questions are my own and may not reflect the views of the Commission as a whole or of other Commissioners. As the nation's consumer protection agency, the FTC is committed to protecting consumer privacy and promoting data security in the private sector. If companies do not protect the personal information they collect and store, information could fall into the wrong hands, resulting in fraud and other harm, and consumers could lose confidence in the marketplace. Although data security has recently been in the news, this is not a new priority for the FTC. To the contrary, for a decade, the FTC has undertaken substantial efforts to promote data security in the private sector through law enforcement, education, policy initiatives, and recommendations to Congress to enact legislation in this area. Since 2001, the FTC has brought 34 cases charging that businesses failed to appropriately protect consumers' personal information. This includes a final settlement that the Commission is announcing today against Ceridian Corporation, a large payroll processor. Ceridian's clients upload their employees' sensitive information, including social security numbers and bank account numbers, which are stored on Ceridian's network. The FTC's complaint charged that Ceridian didn't maintain reasonable safeguards to protect this employee information. As a result, a hacker was able to gain access to it. The FTC's order requires Ceridian to implement a comprehensive data security program and obtain independent audits for 20 years. The Commission also promotes better data security through consumer and business education. For example, on the consumer education front, we sponsor OnGuard Online, a website to educate consumers about basic computer security. Since its launch in 2005, there have been over 14 million unique visits to OnGuard Online and its Spanish language counterpart, Alerta en Línea. We also conduct outreach to businesses, especially small businesses, to provide practical advice about data security. The Commission also engages in policy initiatives to promote data, data security. Last December, FTC staff issued a preliminary report proposing a new framework to improve consumer privacy and data protection. Among other things, the report advocates privacy by design, which includes several principles essential to data security. First, companies, no matter what their size, should employ reasonable physical, technical, and administrative safeguards to protect information about consumers. Second. Companies should collect only that consumer information for which they have a legitimate business need. Third, businesses should retain data only as long as necessary to fulfill the business purpose for which it was collected and should promptly and securely dispose of data they no longer need. As to legislation, the Commission generally supports federal legislation 
similar to your draft proposal that would impose data security standards on companies and require companies in appropriate circumstances to notify consumers when there is a security breach. Reasonable security practices are critical to preventing data breaches, and if a breach occurs, prompt notification to consumers in appropriate circumstances can mitigate harm, such as ID theft. For instance, in the case of a breach of social security numbers, notified consumers can request that fraud alerts be placed in their credit files, obtain copies of their credit reports, and scrutinize their monthly account statements. The Commission is pleased that your draft legislation includes civil pen penalty authority to deter violations, AP APA authority for rulemakings, and jurisdiction over nonprofit entities for data security purposes. I would also like to note that both your draft legislation and the Commission staff's recent privacy report underscore the importance of data minimization to sound data security practices. The FTC looks forward to working with this committee as it moves forward on the Safe Data Act. Thank you again for inviting me to be here and for your leadership on these important issues. And I'm pleased to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes herself for five minutes for questioning. And uh, first question I have, uh, you state the Commission's support for prompt notice <coughs> to consumers. I think it's the crux of what we're all about here. What do you consider prompt? And do you think the consumer notification requirement in the legislation is quick enough? I believe that notification needs to be provided as soon as practicable. Um, I do have um, some concerns about the provision relating to notification in the draft bill. Um, and let me highlight the, the two key concerns. My first concern is that the bill <coughs> requires that there be a risk assessment performed, and then at the conclusion of that risk assessment, um, a company is then obligated to provide notification to consumers and to the FTC um, 48 hours, within 48 hours following that. My concern is that the requirement, that there's no deadline in which to complete a risk assessment, and therefore it, that could take an indefinite amount of time. Without there being some type of limit that's placed on that, I think it places consumers at, at significant risk. Um, another concern um, that we have is that there's also no time limit um, that's placed on in connection with law enforcement, that it could also be an open-ended deadline that could delay prompt notification to consumers. And uh, again, there, there ought to be some form of a cutoff period to ensure that consumers received appropriate notification within an appropriate amount of time so that they can take steps to mitigate any harm that may result from a data breach. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that providing prompt notice to the FTC is also very critical, and in our view, notice to the FTC should be provided at the same time that it's provided to other law enforcement agencies. Thank you. And the FTC has experience under Graham Leach Bliley with the implementation of the safeguards uh, rule for financial institutions under its jurisdiction. The FTC also provided comprehensive guidance for entities to understand how they can comply with the rule. Do those guidelines provide a sufficient indication of the rules uh, for data security? The FTC, FTC would write under Section 2 of this legislation? I think they do provide um, good guidance to companies. Um, in addition to the, uh, re the to particular enforcement matters and consent orders that the Commission makes public, um, the Commission provides many, many different resources online to companies so that they can take appropriate measures to adequately protect consumer information. So under the Section 2 security requirements of the draft legislation, does the FTC have the latitude to write rules that take into account the different types of entities, their level of sophistication, and the amount of type of information they hold? It does, and we appreciate um, that authority being provided to the FTC to promulgate rules detailing those. Do you envision writing different rules or different guidance to, the, to address the concerns that a one-size-fits-all approach is not appropriate? During the rulemaking process, we would be seeking input from stakeholders. Um, and fashioning rules that, um, in light of the input that we received, that we believe would be appropriate to protect consumer. So, information. do you see different standards then for information brokers and small nonprofits, for example? We believe that companies, no matter what the size, need to provide solid and good data security measures. At the same time, the standards that the FTC employs in its enforcement work is a reasonableness standard, so we do take into account the size of a company. The, the nature of the information that's been placed at risk and other factors that may weigh in on that calculus. Since we first started this process six years ago, 46 state laws have emerged. Nearly every one of them, including California, 
have exemptions from the definition of personal information for information made publicly available by the government, and in some cases, information made public by the media. The exemption included in this draft is confined to information made publicly available by the government. Have you seen any problems of unlawful uh, activity associated with publicly available information? Yes, um, we do have concerns about there being an exemption for public, for all public information. The difficulty is that these days there are data brokers that collect information that um, in the past um, uh, one would have to go to very significant uh, measures to collect. You have to go to, you could go to the courthouse, you can collect information through other means, but data aggregators then aggregate this information and when the information, which may very well be public, is then collected, gathered, and aggregated, it can then pose very unique privacy challenges. So we do have concerns about um, there not being uh, a mechanism to address those issues relating to data brokers. And you, you said privacy challenges. Do you mean security challenges or security, privacy? Security challenges. Thank you. All right. I uh, yield back the five seconds of my time, and the chair recognizes Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. The Republican discussion draft makes a change from H.R. 2221 to the definition of personal information. Uh, that seems like a simple and minor change, but it actually is not. Uh, it excludes public record information from the definition of personal information. Given that technology has made access to an aggregation of numerous types of records very cheap and easy, the consequences of this change are quite significant. Uh, before it became cheap and easy to store vast amounts of this information in one place, no one thought about going out and collecting these records. To see these records, you had to, as you said a moment ago, uh, go from town hall to town hall or courthouse to courthouse and look at them one at a time. But now, millions and millions of records regarding millions of our constituents are being kept on servers, usually belonging to information brokers. If you're a criminal wanting to do harm to lots of people in one swoop, the Republican discussion draft will be an advantage to you. Uh, this collection and aggregation in one place has changed the value of this information and its susceptibility to criminal misuse, and it concerns me that this draft bill leaves this information unprotected. Because of the change to the definition of personal information to exclude public record information, there is no longer an obligation to provide any protection at all for this information. Uh, have I said it correctly, Commissioner, or have I misspoken? We agree with, the, with that concern, yes. Do you believe that just because information could have been collected elsewhere, a covered person should be relieved of the obligation to protect this information when they collect and aggregate the information in one place and uh, make it more valuable and potentially more dangerous? Please help me with that. I, I believe that information, even if it's public information, if it's personal information of the consumer, that information ought to be protected and there ought to be appropriate data security measures in place to protect it. All right. I want to take your attention to uh, notification. Do you believe notification to consumers should also be required for breaches involving this kind of information? Yes. The Republican dis discussion draft, uh, like H.R. 2221 before it, provides the FTC, your commission, with the ability to modify the definition of personal information. Only information that is within the meaning of that term is covered by the bill's data security and breach notification requirements. But unlike 2221, the discussion draft seems to set up an overly burdensome and unclear process for modifying that definition. If the FTC wanted to change the definition for the purposes of either the data security or notification sections, uh, it would have to find, among other things, that modification would not unreasonably impede Internet or other technological in innovation or otherwise adversely affect interstate commerce, end of quote. Uh, question, do you believe this language regarding impediments to innovation provides the FTC with much of a clear standard against which to determine whether a modification is appropriate? I do have concerns about the standards um, that are imposed in addition to the limitation on changes to the definition that could impede innovation, as you mentioned, it also requires that the Commission um, only make a change when um, there's a technological change um, at issue, and that's in connection with the data security piece of the, of the proposed um, bill. So that does raise concerns because we feel there are um, 
issues with um, the definition of personal information. It's too narrow, and we would not be able to address those concerns. But well, what would you do? How would you make that determination if you were called upon to do so? Well, again, um, we would want to work with the committee on establishing an appropriate limitation, but let me articulate a couple of concerns that we have with the personal information um, limitation in addition to the public records exemption. Um, two things. First, we believe that the, the financial uh, that the uh, provision focuses solely on financial related information and doesn't take into account, for instance, other information that would be um, sensitive and to a consumer. For instance, um, health information that would not otherwise be protected under HIPAA would not be covered by the language in the draft bill. So that would be a concern that we would not be able to address through the rulemaking that's provided in the draft bill. And what about the language that speaks to impeding in innovation? Uh, I don't know how you define that. That's, that would be yeah. a difficult standard also to apply, and so arguably um, rules by the Commission could be challenged by parties arguing that the change in definition could impede growth and make other arguments. So it would place an undue burden, we believe, on the Commission. Thank you. A year back. I think the gentleman wanted to thank him very much for pointing out the few bracketed points in the legislation where we specifically bracketed them because we too have questions in the draft. So appreciate the clarification and your input. And I appreciate the gentleman's taking the opportunity to raise that. Chair recognizes Mr. Stearns for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one thing I just thought we clear that I think the federal preemptions that they had in my bill in 2005 and the bill that passed in the rush haven't changed. So as I understand, I just want to ask counsel, is that true that the federal preemption have not changed so that any criticism that would be brought from that side because of that, that they, were, they haven't changed at all? Yes, sir. That is correct. Okay. Um, Mr. Ramirez, um, as you're aware, in the bill, the Federal Trade Commission has the authority to change the very fundamental definition of personally identifiable information. So this gives you this broad latitude. I think a lot of us are a little concerned about. Um, do you think there's an opportunity where the Federal Trade Commission, under any circumstances, would trigger the need for them to alter, to update, to change that basic definition, uh, how it's currently drafted in the bill now, because you've got this definition that people understand in the bill, yet you have the authority to change it. Under what circumstances would you change it, and perhaps you could explain what, what would cause it? One circumstance that could arise, it, there could be changes in technology that could require additional information um, but isn't needed. personal um, but, but identifiable let me also, information pretty much well, technology neutral because it represents an understanding of the privacy of the individual? I think um, the precise scope may be hard to define, but what the Commission is absolutely willing to work with the committee to come up with a definition that would meet everyone's and satisfy everyone's concerns. The current definition, we believe, is too narrow. We also believe that the rulemaking that's provided is too limited. Um, I will say that um, the rulemaking process that the Commission employs um, is a, a process by which we do seek input from stakeholders, and we believe that through that rulemaking process we would be able to address any need for change, but at the same time taking into account any concerns that uh, you and others uh, may have, Congressman. Well, I think that's what probably if I was in industry I'd be concerned that the government at the Congress is turning over this power to you, and you might make these changes without a comment period. There might be changes that would affect a business that uh, would make it much more difficult. Let me go on to my second question. Uh, in the bill, they added data minimization provisions. Um, now, this is, this is something new in, in, in my bill, and also it's, it's new from the Rush bill. How do you see this provision playing out? For, for members or people who don't understand, this is basically uh, forcing industry to get rid of information that perhaps they would like to keep. It's not a, a decision they make. It's a mandated mandate, which is included in the bill, as I understand it. So I guess the question is, how do you see this provision playing out, and what role do you believe, if any, the FTC should have in ensuring that companies are complying? So you have this mandate. The companies might not agree, 
So if they don't do it, uh, what are you going to? How are you going to check it? And how are you going to make them comply? What the commission advocates is that companies only re uh, retain in information that they have a legitimate business need to retain. And who and that determines they, that? And that they also only retain it for a, for the who time period. Who determines that, though? They need it. I think we would apply a reasonableness standard, um, which is consistent. What kind with of standards? A reasonableness standard, which is the standard that the FTC has employed throughout the course of its enforcement in this arena. So this reasonable standard, in your mind, is been pretty much established at the FTC, so everybody in industry would understand today what it is? What I'm saying is that the standard that would be applied would be a reasonableness standard, and I believe uh, th um, it's an issue that, that may need to be fleshed out. Um, and again, the Commission is willing to work with the committee in order to do that. Any rulemaking that does take place would entail a comment period, absolutely entail a comment period. Um, I believe that the, that the FTC has a very solid track record yeah. in terms of its rulemaking. So I think this is an area, again, the, the standard that the FTC has always applied in the area of data security is one of reasonableness, taking into account the nature of the information, um, how sensitive it is, the potential risks to consumers. So it would be um, a reasonableness standard that would be applied. Do you think that uh, the Congress should set the broad outline for this data minimization provision and not give it any authority to the FTC, or do you think you need to have that authority to make that decision? I think it would be appropriate to give authority and flexibility to the FTC to provide additional guidance to companies as to how to effectuate um, those requirements. Yeah, thank you. All right. G gentlemen's time has expired. The Chair recognizes Mr. Waxman for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, again, looking at this draft bill, I have some questions. Uh, so that we can get your input on it. And I, as I look at the draft bill, there's a notice that must be given to the Federal Trade Commission and the consumers when there's been a, a, an electronic data breach. But it's only required uh, after the covered person, the people who, a company who has the, the identifying information, has done certain things in connection with the breach. The covered person must, one, assess the nature and scope of the breach, makes sense, take steps to further prevent breach or unauthorized disclosure, and then three, restore the integrity of the data system. Now, those clearly are the priorities for, the, for the, the company itself. After they've done all that, the covered person must determine the risk to the consumer, and after they've reached that conclusion, within 48 hours, they're supposed to give the notice to the FTC and the consumer. But there's no limit in this draft bill for how long a person can take to complete steps one, two, and three. There's just no limit. The covered person, company, knows about a breach. could take a week, a year, maybe five years. And then within 48 hours of that, provide notice to the Federal Trade Commission and the consumers. The bill from the last Congress uh, included an outer limit of 60 days from the discovery of the breach to provide notice of the breach. That outer limit has been dropped from this discussion draft. If uh, we were to include an outer limit, how long should that limit be, in your opinion? In my view and in the Commission's view is that the time for notification should be as soon as practically uh, possible. Um, that may differ depending on the circumstances. Um, I believe that, that 60 days should be at, at most an outer limit. Um, again, our, our view is that the sooner would be th would the better. The sooner that notice is provided, the sooner that a consumer can take appropriate steps to protect um, and try to minim and mitigate any harm that may result from a breach. Um, so I, I, there, I don't believe that there's uh, a particular number that I can give you sitting here today because it may depend on the circumstances, on um, the nature of the breach, the size of the company, um, but I would say that it, the 60 days would be at most an, an outer limit. 60 days wouldn't be an outer limit, but as soon as practicable, the, that yes. information ought to go to the consumer that they, their identity has been uh, compromised. That's correct. By the security leak. Uh, thank you for that. The discussion draft provides an exemption from the bill's data security requirements for entities that are subject to uh, data security requirements under different bills, the Graham-Leach-Bliley or the Health Insurance Portability and Account Accountability Act. 
or any uh, uh, for any activities governed by the GLB and the and the HIPAA. Now this is a departure from last year's year's bill. Last year's bill uh, sa only said that compliance with these two other statutes meant you were in compliance with the requirements of this legislation as it w as it was drafted, provided that the requirements of uh, GLB and HIPAA were similar or greater than those required under last year's bill. The language was not phrased as exemption for entities subject to FTC jurisdiction, but rather as an alternative means of compliance. It's unclear to me whether under the draft bill, the Federal Trade Commission maintains the ability to enforce any data security requirements against those entities or if the safeguards in those other laws must meet or exceed those in the discussion draft. Do you believe that this exemption could potentially limit the Federal Trade Commission's enforcement abilities with respect to entities subject to the other two statutes, uh, uh, those other two statutes, and uh, could you explain your answer to that? Uh, under my reading of this, uh, of the bill, I do believe that it creates a, potentially creates a gap in, in authority because it does exempt entities that are subject to FTC jurisdiction from um, having breach notification requirements, which are not required under Graham uh, Leach Bliley. So that, that is a concern about there being a potential gap in authority. And, and do you believe this exemption could potentially lead to a disparity in the security requirements for non bank financial institutions and everyone else under the FTC? I do. And what's your understanding of the effect of the phrase, any activities governed by uh, the GLB or HIPAA, on the scope of this exemption? What is the Graham Leach Bliley activity, is that just issuing privacy notices? Is that following the FTC's safeguards rule, or is that marketing? I, that, again, that activity based um, exemption, um, it's a little bit unclear exactly how, how broadly it might be interpreted, but I think that the key point is that it does create a disparity between the obligations. Of, uh, finan of certain financial institutions, so that it is a concern about um, in connection with, with the authority that's provided. Thank you. Madam Chair, I, I just want to point this out as some, an area where we need to work together to uh, make sure that uh, there's uh, no uh, am ambiguity or, or poor drafting that uh, would undermine what we're trying to achieve. I thank the gentleman very much. I agree with his uh, questioning and agree with his assessment about where we can fortify the bill, and I look forward to working with you on that. And the chair is hap uh, happy to recognize Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the chair. Commissioner Ramirez, welcome. Thank you for your time today. Um, as you know, the Safe Data Act would require an entity to begin to notify as promptly as possible, and that's a quote, individuals whose personal information was acquired or assessed in a breach following an assessment, and that notification should be based on risk of harm, not just on the fact that a breach had occurred. Otherwise, we may find ourselves in a situation where consumers are flooded with notices by companies, become desensitized, and then may not take action to protect themselves when there is a real risk due to a significant breach where personal identifiable information was stolen and identity theft could occur. As currently drafted, this legislation standard for risk is, quote, reasonable risk of harm. In response to my colleague, uh, Congressman Stern's questions, you said that that is the standard that the FTC supports. Do you think consumers would be better served in the long run if the standard were changed to, quote, significant risk of harm, end quote? And what, in your opinion, is the difference between a reasonable risk of harm and a significant risk of harm? I don't think that consumers would be better served if the standard were to be elevated to a significant risk. Um, I think um, the key objective, as I understand it, of the draft bill is to ensure that consumers are appropriately protected um, if there is a breach. And my concern would be that by imposing a, a higher standard, um, that key objective would be undermined. Um, so I think it's appropriate to apply a reasonableness standard. By my, my fear is that by using the word significant, um, it might just be a standard that might be too too high and that it would risk undermining the ability of consumers to take effective steps to protect themselves if there is uh, a breach in security. 
And uh, one more question, Commissioner, a couple more. Does the Commission see the concerns about the dangers of over, over notification or uh, as my 14-year-old daughter and 11-year-old son would say, spam? In my view, the greater danger is that consumers not be provided adequate notice to protect themselves against data breaches. So I don't, I don't believe that over notification is a serious issue. I would be more concerned about not providing adequate protection if the standard were to be elevated. Yes, ma'am. I'm sure we can agree that there's some balance there between over notification and, and timely notification. That's right. And I believe the reasonableness standard um, accommodates that. Okay. Thank you for that. One final question. Why does the FTC feel so strongly about uh, get, obtaining authority uh, over nonprofits and universities for data security breaches? The issue there is that regardless of the nature of the particular entity, um, if the entity does have personal information about a consumer and there's a data breach, there is harm to the consumer regardless of whether that entity is either a nonprofit or a for-profit entity. So, so that distinction, um, in our view, um, would not provide adequate protection. So we're pleased to see that the draft bill does provide coverage for nonprofits. Yes, ma'am. I'm hearing some concerns from the, uh, the nonprofit sector and the universities about this, this provision, and, and I'd like to work with you forward and work with the chairman uh, to resolve these concerns back home for the people I represent. We would be pleased to do so. Great. Thank you, ma'am. I yield back my time. I think the gentleman in the chair recognizes Mr. Gonzalez for five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, uh, Chairwoman. Uh, to my colleagues who have worked on this for the past few years, again, just that we continue down this road and haven't been successful yet. Uh, we've passed things out of the House, and, and then uh, we can't say that much about controlling anything that the Senate does. But it doesn't mean that we will not be moving timely and aggressively. Uh, to Mr. Stearns, thank you for his leadership. I still remember way back then, Cliff, when we used to say, uh, uh, don't collect it if you can't protect it. Remember we used to say that? And I think we're still saying that. And what has transpired since that time is that we haven't had the safeguards. We haven't had the review and the protections, of course. And we've just had, what have we had? We've had more breaches. I'd like to think that had we had something in place, we would not have uh, the occurrences that we that have transpired recently. Uh, Commissioner Ramirez, thank you very much for being here today. My question is going to go to information brokers, and I do want to compare past efforts with the present effort, and and hopefully uh, we can even improve uh, what we have in in the initial draft. Um, HR twenty two. 21 had a lot is it related to information brokers and I just want to get your opinion as to whether uh, any new version of legislation should maybe also include uh, some of these responsibilities that information brokers should be charged with uh, we had accuracy access and dispute resolution uh, aspects or provisions uh, when it came to brokers but I'm going to be a little more specific on some things that I believe in in at this early date, uh, the draft would not include, and I'm going to ask whether you think it'd be important that we would include these particular provisions. Uh, 2221 required information brokers to submit its security policies to the FTC. Is that a good idea? I think generally um, data security brokers need to be covered under any appropriate legislation. Um, just as any other entity would be. If they, if they collect information about a consumer, they ought to be covered. Uh, 2221 permitted the FTC to conduct an audit or require each information broker to conduct an audit of its security practices. Good provision? Uh, again, um, I think the uh, data security measures that apply to other entities ought to apply equally to data brokers because any entity that collects gathers and uses personal information of, con of consumers need to have appropriately protective data security measures. Maybe even more so, since that's their primary objective and activity, is it not? As opposed to someone else that, again, relative to their own commercial transaction, may require certain information that is personal in nature and needs to be protected. But we're talking about information brokers. The very purpose of their existence is to do what? I understand the point. My, all I'm trying to say is that all entities that gather information that's personal to consumers create a potential risk of harm when there's a, when there's a data breach. So from the Commission's perspective, we don't want to draw distinctions. If an entity collects and uses consumer information, there ought to be appropriate 
um, data security measures, and absolutely they ought to apply it to data brokers. And that's the reason it was in 2221, and we would agree with you, of course. The last two, because I have about a minute and a half, required the FTC to promulgate rules requiring information brokers to establish measures facilitating the investigation of breaches. Would that be important? Yes. And lastly, prohibit information brokers from pretexting the practice of obtaining information through false representations. Yes. Thank you very much. Now you back, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman, and the chair recognizes Mr. Pompeo for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for being here today, Ms. Ramirez. Uh, you, you talked about your concern that this for the exemption for publicly available information. That you said that now with current technology, it has it has increased the value of that information. Can you give me an example of what you're thinking of? I think there are a number of companies that gather. Um, information about consumers because it, it may aid, for instance, in connection with advertising and online behavioral advertising in particular. So uh, I know that the, the Wall Street Journal uh, um, series has identified a number of companies that do this. It's a, an area that's of significant concern to the Commission. Um, and again, regardless of the fact that the information may be publicly available, given that it's now aggregated and that can, it can be accessed technologically in a much, um, much more easily, it raises significant data security concerns. And what kind of information is you're concerned about? Is it addresses? Is it tell, tell me what it is you're, that's publicly available that you're concerned about this aggregation of this information in the hands of these people you think are going to do harm? It could be addresses. Um, it could be name, uh, family members that reside in, in, in a house. That combined with other information could potentially lead to um, security concerns. Okay, thank you. I want to come back to something. Uh, uh, Congressman Stearns was speaking. I was talking about the, the definition uh, in the draft of legitimate business purposes. And if I understood your testimony correctly, you want to retain the authority, that you want the FTC to retain the authority to define that. That is to say, we're going to apply a reasonableness standard. Is that, is that correct? That's right. I, I, for, forgive me for my skepticism. <laughs> Um, I, 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 I forgive, I, I've spent 16 years in business, and when the federal government says, don't worry, we'll be reasonable, it, it causes my uh, well, alarm me, bells to go off Perhaps in my head. it might help if I can articulate a concern. Um, in many of these data breach um, cases, we find that um, information has been maintained for very lengthy periods of time when, in fact, the company really had no reason to maintain that information. So that, that's why we, um, uh, and I personally believe that, Companies need to be take greater care in ensuring that the consumer information that they maintain is is needed. And if it's no longer needed, mm -hmm. they should dispose of that information safely. Otherwise, it just increases um, the potential for harm should there be a breach. Suppose a company had some information and and they had no real current use for it, but they thought there might be value in that information 20 years from now. They might be able to sell their business, and someone else might be able to use that information but they couldn't touch today what exactly it is they thought the value of that was. But a legitimate business person, at least in that business owner's mind, was, you know, I think there's value there. I worked to get that information. I obtained that information lawfully, and I now possess it. And I'd just like to hang on to it because I think there may be a good lawful use for that information sometime down the road. Would you consider that after 10 or 20 years? Would you consider that a legitimate business purpose in retaining that information? I would be concerned that um, there are many companies that do make that statement. Um, my concern is that that's at odds with the desire to have adequate security um, because, again, the, the more that you keep information, um, the greater danger that it creates. So I'm not going to sit here and say uh, it can only be after five years. I think there needs to be a, an appropriate assessment under particular facts and circumstances. Um, but with, what we what the, we do advocate, and I personally believe, is that companies need to take a greater look at their practices, at their data security practices, to ensure that they minimize the possible risks of harm to consumers. Right. I, I'm not speaking to their practices in terms of securing that data. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm simply speaking to their desire to hold on to this thing that they view as their property, right? This thing that they've paid for and worked for and worked really hard to maintain, and they're, they're, they're engaged in the most, the, the most capable security process you can imagine. They've not had a breach, and all they want to do is hold on to their property. And But as, as I hear you, there's some risk that the FTC is going to come in and say, sorry, not legitimate. No, 
Again, I think that the standard to be applied is reasonableness. I think what the FTC and, and I personally believe is that companies just simply need to take a stronger look at, and ask the question, do we really truly need this information and not just simply use the concept of, oh, we may need it down the line without care uh, to ask important questions about whether that information is is um, entirely needed. Great. Thank you. I have no problem. And, and again, our, our focus is on information. I, I can just give you an example. Um, I highlighted one case um, today, Ceridian, where Social Security numbers were being retained um, for a period when they were no longer needed in that particular instance. Um, again, there was no need to maintain those. So, so And when you say needed, you mean in your mind as opposed to in the company's mind? The company no longer had to, had reason to maintain those Social Security numbers, and unfortunately there was a breach, and it created significant um, risk of harm to consumers. Thank you. My, my time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The chair is pleased to recognize the Chairman Emeritus of the committee, uh, Mr. Dingle, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Welcome, Commissioner Ramirez. I'll be asking yes and no questions, so I would appreciate your cooperation because time is short. Now, the draft legislation pending our consideration exempts entities that must comply with Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, or GLBA. The Federal Trade Commission's rule to implement the data privacy requirements of GLBA is known as the Safeguard Rule. Is that correct? Yes. Now, Commissioner, does the Safeguard Rule require that covered entity, uh, that a covered entity under the jurisdiction of FTC notify a consumer of a data breach within a certain period of time, yes or no? No, it does not. Uh, Commissioner, so an entity regulated by FTC that is covered under GLBA, but not the draft bill, is under no statutory or regulatory obligation to notify consumers of a data breach within a time certain. Is that correct? Yes. Now, it would seem to me that we should consider removing the draft bill's GLBA exemption, as well as to include HR 2221's 60 day backstop notification in the interest of improving consumer protection. Now, the draft bill allows the Commission to modify the definition of the term personal information according to the Administrative Procedure Act, or APA, which I applaud. I'm worried, however, though, that the bill imposes vague conditions on the Commission to be satisfied before it can commence a rulemaking. I fear that the effect would be that the Commission may never amend the definition of personal information. Now, Commissioner, has the Commission examined this matter? And if so, uh, does the Commission share my opinion on the matter? We do have concerns about um, the ability of the FTC to modify the definition of personal information, as I've articulated earlier in my testimony. Now, I would re request that the Commission submit its comments for the record. Would you do that for us, please? Yes, of on course. This question? Now, I understand the, ra the draft bill does not treat data brokers any different from other entities that collect and store personal information. This is a change from H.R. 2221, which, which by the way, uh, passed the House overwhelmingly, uh, which describes additional requirements for data brokers. The bill does not contain provisions that allow consumers to have regional, uh, reasonable access to information data bro brokers who collect information about them. Is that correct? Yes. Now, Commissioner, does the Commission believe that brokers should be subject to more stringent data security and breach notification requirements than other entities that collect and store personal information? Yes or no? In my view, um, yes. Would you, would you submit such amplification of that as you might deem appropriate? Yes. Now, Commissioner, does the Commission believe that consumers should have a statutory right to reasonable access of the personal information that data brokers collect about them? Yes in, or no? In my view, yes. And I, I believe you would say that uh, that's the only way you're going to assure that they will have that right to access. Is that right? In my view, yes. Now, Madam Chairman, I appreciate your work on the bill so far, and I want to thank you for this hearings. As my questions have indicated, I believe there are parts of the bill that can be improved. I stand by to work with you and am ready to assist you and the rest of our colleagues in order to report a bipartisan consensus bill 
that offers consumers the best protections possible. And I would observe just quickly once more, the FTC has substantial experience in the protection of personal privacy uh, in, uh, from data collectors and things of that kind. Is that not so, uh, Madam Commissioner? Yes. So, Madam Chairman, I thank you for the courtesy, and I yield back the balance of my time, which constitutes 37 seconds. Thank you. And I thank the gentleman very much and recognize uh, Mr. Guthrie for five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Commissioner, for being here. I appreciate this. And this is a, a serious uh, issue that we have to address, and it looks like there's going to be significant work to do this in a way that, that is bipartisan. And I don't really think about this, as Mr. Pompeo said, but... You know, some of the things, and, and I learned when I was in the state legislature involved in writing law and so forth, is that we got we have to be as clear as we can because you see things, and just an example, you know, laws written 50, 60 years ago today are being used to, I think, doing interpretations by agencies that were never intended. And so we just want to be careful that we're not just dealing with each other and we know each other, we know each other are thinking, but we got to think what's going to happen as we go down the road. And, and there, so in that, you know, I say, You've been there, and we had an FCC here before, and they said, well, we're trying to solve uncertainty. This may have to be decided in court if what we're doing is, is right. So when we look at words like reasonable and significant risk, reasonable risk, just kind of understanding what we're thinking. And so I know we talk about reasonable risk in data security and significant risk. risk. And if you would um, kind of talk about the differences in those two and, and the cost of complying, I guess, for a business, or in, in the level of security for consumers. We've got to decide, give the consumer the security they can't they have with the business having the knowledge or the certainty what it's going to cost them to do so they can plan and move forward. So just the difference in reasonable and significant risk in your mind, I guess. In my mind, the concern that I had was that the, using the word significant would elevate the standard and the result would be that it would undermine protection to the consumer. The FTC has applied a reasonableness standard throughout its enforcement history in this arena, um, and it really does depend on the particular circumstances. We would like to take into account, again, the, the nature of the information that might be at issue, the size of a company, um, the costs that may be involved. So I believe that taking um, a flexible approach allows us to fashion the right balance between um, the costs that and burdens that may be imposed on business, um, as well as making sure that we have robust protection for consumers. Now, I also want to highlight that the cases that the agency has brought in this arena have been, have related to very basic and fundamental failures in data security. These have not been close calls. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I hope that provides some assurance um, to those who may have concerns. Yeah, I'm not an attorney. I did have one law school class. Uh, and uh, the, the, the questions on tests aren't usually the obvious things, and, and that's where we, usually there's some area that, that, that's why it ends up in court, not that it's clear that somebody had data for 20 years, had social security numbers, had no need for them, and somebody breached and took them. Matter of fact, at the expense of what a breach costs a company, I wouldn't want to hold on to that information more than if I didn't have a purpose or a need for it. But one, and I won't hit one thing, and I'll, I'll yield back. Um, you talked earlier about the, the time for, con, for notification was too long, I guess, in the draft you thought was too long. And I didn't, did you say what you thought was reasonable for that or what you suggest? Our, our view is that notification ought to be provided as soon as is practically feasible mm -hmm. because, again, the, the circumstances may change. In certain situations, it may be appropriate to have a short requirement of just a few days. In other situations, it may, there may be a need for a company to take more time to, write, to provide notification. So I think there ought to be an outer limit, um, and I've suggested that 60 days would be an outer limit. But again, that's an outer limit. Our view is the sooner the better because that allows consumers to take appropriate steps to mitigate any potential harm. Oh, I agree with that exactly. It depends on how we define that. That's how you define that. And again, I think yeah. it is important to preserve some flexibility because it may differ depending on particular facts and circumstances. Yeah, I think there was one testimony in a previous hearing this to, trying to figure out how, what, what happened, and, and they were trying to go through that. And, but you're right because, I mean, I would want to know as soon as practicable as the that was one of those words you argue, practical or practicable, As soon right? as it's you feasible. So, but you're right. That's absolutely right. So I appreciate that and look forward to working with the chairwoman, and thank you for your courtesy. Thank you, gentlemen, for not being a lawyer. You should play one well on TV. Uh, <laughs> <With> the, <food. laughs> the chair is happy to recognize Ms. Shikowsky for five minutes.
else I can add on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and let me just say that this uh, committee has a history of working in a bipartisan uh, basis, and, and the House did pass out um, H.R. 20, is it 21, whatever that brush bill was that I was a co-sponsor of. Um, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we worked uh, very closely to, together. and. As uh, Mr. Stern says, this has been going on since 2005. I'm so hopeful that we will be able to um, craft a bill. I feel confident that we will be able to, uh, to, to craft a bill. In some respects, this draft is even better, the quickness of certain notification. Um, but um, we, we need to focus on, I think, where those, those differences are. So let me just uh, ask a, a couple of questions, um, Ms. Ramirez. Um, the, the Republican discussion draft includes language that I'm concerned could have a narrowing effect that we don't totally understand. The, the draft um, narrows application of the bill's data security and notification requirements to per persons engaged in interstate commerce with personal information, quote, related to that commercial activity, unquote. So let's take someone a company like Amazon that's in the business of selling books. And in that process, it generally collects your full name, address, credit card number, and, uh, and security code. But what if they also ask you for your social security number? I don't think they need that to, to sell a book. And if they did ask you for it, it probably wouldn't be to sell you that book. And what about um, other information that isn't at this time within the meaning of personal information, like an IP address. So I know this is a, a fairly technical point, so you may not have an, an answer right now, but to the extent you can, do you know how the FTC would interpret and implement this phrase, quote, related to that commercial activity? I think we would interpret it um, co to be coextensive with our jurisdiction over entities that engage in, in interstate commerce. I think it'd be relatively broadly interpreted. Um, again, the precise scope of the of the definition is an area that we can, we're happy to work with the committee to ensure that we um, assist in, in the committee coming up with a, a suitable definition that, that um, addresses the concerns that have been articulated today. Well, I'm, d I'm just worried that it is ambiguous language and we may want to work with you and work with the, the committee to, uh, to tighten that up. And we would absolutely be pleased to work, work with you on that language. Great. Here we go, H.R. 2221 from the last Congress and the Republican discussion draft of the Safe Data Act require notice to the FTC and consumers of an electronic data breach only if the covered person has determined that the breach, quote, presents a reasonable risk of identity theft, fraud, or other unlawful conduct. I, I know that others have asked this, but I wonder if one more time, do you believe this, tr this trigger for notification based on reasonable risk, et cetera, uh, is, uh, is appropriate? I do. I think that the standard of reasonable risk um, gives appropriate flexibility and uh, to accommodate both the uh, need to protect consumers as well as the need to take into account um, uh, any burdens, um, um, and excessive burdens on, on business. And it, it falls on the covered person to determine whether or not the trigger um, has been uh, for notification to the FTC um, and consumers uh, has has been been met. Do you believe it is appropriate for the covered person to make the ultimate determination about the risk posed to consumers from a data breach and whether notice to the FTC and consumers is required? And if not, who should make that determination and how should they go about doing that? That's a serious concern that the, uh, that we have. Um, we believe that the FTC ought to be notified at the same time as other law enforcement agencies so that we can also um, examine the issue and determine um, if there ought to be uh, notification um, that may differ from the determination that's made by the company. Thank you. And, uh, and finally, in the few seconds I have, um, H.R. 2221, um, uh, but require notice to law enforcement, the FTC, and consumers in the end event of a data breach involving electronic records. There is no requirement for notice in the event of a data breach involving paper records. Do you believe the scope of the notification requirement should be expanded to include data breaches involving paper records? I do. I believe that paper records can also pose serious concerns and, and risks to consumers. 
Thank you, and I yield back. At Thank zero. <laughs> Thank the gentlelady. And the uh, chair, I was going to give Christmas presents that equaled per second, like Christmas gifts would be valued by the size of the amount of time you give back. Um, she was happy to recognize Mr. Harper for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. And thank you, Commissioner, for being here and uh, giving us your insight uh, into this. Uh, if I could just uh, talk a little bit more about uh, reasonable risk or significant risk, and uh, you've, you've indicated you uh, support the, the reasonable risk uh, standard. Uh, how do you define that reasonable risk? What do you see that being? I think if the information that, that's at issue um, is potentially going to be misused, can be misused to harm consumers, I think there ought to be a presumption that there ought to be notification. Um, again, I, I do, um, do want to highlight um, that the uh, agency has done significant work in this arena and our enforcement actions and the consent orders that we've entered into, I think, um, can elaborate more fully on the situations that we have found where, um, where action um, was necessary. So, but again, I think there needs to be flexibility. I think reasonableness accomplishes that, and I'm, I would be concerned about uh, changing that standard. So you said the commission's done significant work versus reasonable work. <laughs> we, have, we have great experience in the area of data security. All right, so, so how, would we, uh, how would we vary with significant? If, if, the, if the standard was significant risk, how would you view that different than I, reasonable I think it's, risk? It's, it's, a, diff, it's a, a flexible concept, and I, I don't have any magic words to articulate here today, but I think in, in my mind the, the key um, is how do we best protect consumers, and if that's the aim of the legislation, um, I believe that... that um, we ought to err in favor of protecting consumers, given that we know that the incidence of identity theft um, and data breach, by the way, is, is one significant cause of identity theft, continues to be such a significant concern. It is the most, um, we receive the most complaints relating to identity theft um, than any other complaint, and that's been in the last decade. So it remains a very significant concern. So reasonable would be in the eye of the beholder in, in some instances is how we, we define this. No, I believe that you can establish, you know, objective standards. The reasonableness is a concept that is, you know, well um, defined in, in many different areas and used in many different areas of law. So I think it's one that, that can be employed um, in a way that I think would address concerns. I think it maintains appropriate flexibility and allows one to balance um, potentially competing interests. You know, and I, I know as we go through the discussion draft and we look at it, there's going to be that discussion between reasonable and significant risk. Uh, you know, uh, of course, as you know, in the, in the practice of law, some, you'll have uh, preponderance of the evidence or in a criminal case beyond a reasonable doubt, but, but also there's clear and convincing. So I think you're going to have that, that tug uh, back and forth between uh, reasonable and significant, wanting to protect the consumers, but also looking at uh, how the businesses will deal with this. So, uh, you know, I appreciate your input uh, on that. Uh, as we as we look at the notification of uh, when you believe FTC should be notified, you believe they should be notified at the same time as law enforcement. Is that what I, you've stated? I do. Yes. Okay. And uh, and what period of time do you think is the the optimum? time for you to get that notification? Um, I, I think I, um, as soon as, as the, the breach takes, takes place, I'm now not remembering if this bill is specific on that point, sure. but, but essentially at the very outset when other law enforcement agencies are notified. When, uh, when we look at that specific time limit, uh, you know, these, these are certainly great concern, as, as, as you've stated and as we know. Uh, data breach is, is something that everybody is concerned about and, uh, and with this age that we have. So uh, what, tell, me, tell me why you believe that the FTC should be notified prior to the consumers. As a law enforcement agency, um, I think it's important that the FTC be provided prompt notification so that it can take appropriate action if necessary. Yeah. Um, in addition, I think that um, waiting for the outcome of a particular company to engage in its own risk assessment um, risks um, a situation where a company may perhaps conclude that notification won't be necessary to consumers. The FTC may have a different view of it and it provides an additional level of assurance um, and protection for consumers. 
Well, let, let me uh, end with this quickly. Uh, do you believe that this, uh, this legislation uh, that will address the current and evolving environment with respect to uh, cloud computing? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Do you, do you think that this, this legislation appropriately addresses the current and evolving environment with respect to cloud computing? Um, I do. I think, I think um, again, cloud computing um, uh, isn't, of course, uh, the wave of the future, um, but the data security measures ought to apply to cloud computing just as it, they do to other methods of storage. Thank you. With that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes Dr. Cassidy for five minutes. Um, Ms. Ms. Ramirez, um, examples of health info which are not covered by HIPAA, can you give me those? Let me give you an example from um, one of the uh, matters that the FTC handled, um, the e Eli Lilly matter, which involved um, the release of information about um, individuals who had used Prozac. Um, HIPAA only covers particular entities such as hospitals, doctor's offices. So a non-covered entity, if you will. It would be non-covered entity, correct. Now, you, so then this may answer my next question. It seems, as I'm trying to understand this, that you, all, you, you effect have two sets of data, one with unique identifiers and the other that is gained from publicly um, accessible information that you have a similar concern even though it may not have a unique identifier. Is that correct? Well, it's not the issue of a unique identifier. Again, with, when it comes to public records, our concern is that once you compile information and you gather information that in the past might have been very difficult to collect, once it's collected in one place, that can then raise very serious concerns. So what are those concerns? When you have um, data aggregators that are gathering information about... Well, I understand what a data well, aggregator okay. is. Once I understand that information that. is gathered... So they get all the data about mortgages being sold in Washington, D.C. Uh, One example could be that they may have information um, that might... Um, uh, can be given to a payday lender, for instance, because they have information that may reveal, have indications about income level. Um, that, that information can then be used by a payday lender or someone who is... is aims to engage in some type of fraudulent activity. Now, a payday lender is not inherently fraudulent. No, 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 no. But my, my point is that it, it can be used by persons who may want seek to misuse that information. So it's very imp but important. But that's true of that all information, information in a free society, correct? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous about limiting access to publicly available information. And I don't necessarily disagree with you, but, I, but it always seems like we should have a bias towards openness uh, knowing that those, so so why should we not have this bias towards openness if it is, if it is not being used by a fraudulent and if it is uh, entity and if it is publicly available otherwise? The the key is to ensure that appropriate measures are taken to protect the information that's been aggregated. You then you now have an ability with these data aggregators who've gathered just a treasure trove of information that that again previously may not have been easily accessible. You keep um, saying and so, that, and I understand that. I understand that issue. What I don't know is what danger you see with that. And I'm asking you, you, openly. So, so my, I, the danger can be that it can be misused for a number of reasons. But I guess um, all information could be misused. All information can be misused. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to understand. So, uh, the, the fundamental point is that that information needs to be protected. And if that information has, if there's been a breach, the consumer ought to be notified. And in the case of, of data brokers, I, I believe that there ought to be some additional requirements where a consumer may have Can you give me, just so I understand better, because clearly I'm struggling, can you give me a specific example of where, and, and just so I can understand, again, I'm not challenging, I'm trying to understand, a specific example of where a data aggregator uh, had data that was breached that did not include a social, did not include a credit card number, a security code. It was just like, you know, Bill Cassidy, he's a congressman from Baton Rouge, and he's got three kids, and et cetera, et cetera. Are you with me? Let me give you one example. Um, information relating to income, for instance, is information that might be um, gathered or somehow ascertained through the, the access of publicly available information. Now, I'm told when I, when I suddenly saw all these catalogs I was getting back when people sent catalogs, that they looked at my census tract and they said, oh, he's in a pretty good census tract. And so therefore I started getting an incredible number of catalogs. Now, are we going to restrict the ability of someone to know what census tract I live in? No, but I think you can provide um, access rights so that if, for instance, again, let me go back. Now, to now, now I don't, now the access rights is a separate issue. Uh, the access rights I gather from Mr. Dingle's uh, thoughts, it actually seems, I can see some use in that. 
But again, I'm wondering, so, what is the inherent not, damage? We would not be restricting the ability to gather the information that's publicly available. We would simply want there to be adequate security measures to protect the information, and we would want there to be um, notification to the consumer in appropriate circumstances. And in light of potential misuse of the information, additional requirements such as access would maybe one way of addressing, but we're, I'm not advocating that there be a limitation on the ability. At the uh, risk of losing my Christmas presents, I will say, though, that it almost seems that if you have one with credit card numbers and socials and medical, you know, military identification numbers, that clearly should be in its own silo. The other seems, um, the other seems, I'm not sure, and I'm sure there's going to be an expense in terms of being in this silo. The other seems to me inherently less, uh, I don't know, onerous as regards the protective measures taken because it doesn't have the same import if somebody knows I've got three kids and live in the census tract as opposed to knowing my social. My apologies if I haven't been able to fully articulate the potential risks that we see, and, and my staff is very happy to, to work you with that? you and to again, provide some additional just information if, if I've not been able to answer your that. question adequately. Thank you. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, recognize Mr. Rush for five minutes. Congress is now that massive mega data breaches could and will occur, and we've had the vision to introduce legislation to make these breaches more difficult to perpetuate and that would make consumers uh, as close as to whole as possible when they pick, uh, when they piece back together their personal lives and identities. The Data Accountability and Trust Act that I reintroduced in May along with Congressman Martin uh, and Congressman Schakowsky, uh is essentially the same bill that was passed out of this committee in December 09 in the 111th Congress as H.R. 2221. The bill, that bill passed out of the House on suspension and was then referred to the Senate Commerce Committee. When I became chair of the subcommittee in the 110th country, uh, Congress, I introduced H.R. 958, which has since been shaped uh, to keep up with online and network technologies and, merging, and emerging formats for storing consumer data. These technologies and formats improve consumers' lives and make new and exciting business and re revenue models viable. But it's been important in our approach to maintain technologically neutral so that we don't pick winners and losers and also cognizant and remain cognizant of the unique natures of the business models and realities involving what the bill defines as service providers, uh, information brokers, and fault uh, databases. And uh, uh, Madam Commissioner, I only have a few minutes, so I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I intend to ask each panel these questions. So if I can get a yes or no answer, uh, that would certainly help me. And if I don't get to ask the question, I have some that I will refer to you uh, in writing uh, for the record. Should commercial entities that do business in interstate commerce be required under, under federal law to protect individuals' personal information by securing it and, and protecting it from improper access? Yes. And when these uh, entities contract <coughs> with a third party, to maintain that personal data, should they be further required to establish and imp implement information security policies and procedures? Yes. Should the FTC be authorized to prescribe what those policies and procedures ought to be? Yes. Should personal information be defined to include an individual's first name or initial and last name or address or phone number in combination with any of uh, any or uh, with any one or more of the following an individual's social security number I believe that that would be too narrow a uh, definition I, I've got a number of them. Uh, sorry. yes or no <laughs> yes or no um, I believe no a driver's license number no Passport number, military number, or similar, uh, similar identification number issued on a government document for verified identity? No. 
A financial account number? No. A credit card number? No. A debit card number? No. Or any uh, security access code or password needed to assess uh, the account? No. Should information brokers be required to submit their data uh, security policies to the FCC? Yes. Should information brokers be required to establish procedures that consumers may follow to review and, if necessary, dispute the accuracy of their personal data? In my view, yes. Well, uh, thank you very much. You've been very kind and helpful. And with that, Madam Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank the gentleman. The chair recognizes Ms. Blackburn for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you for being here with us uh, today. And I, I want to stay with this personally identified information uh, because I think that that gets to um, kind of the crux of the matter when you talk to our constituents and you look at how they've reacted to what has transpired um, with the Sony breach uh, and the amount of time that uh, was required to inform people there. You can go back as far as the TJX breach and the amount of time and the inconvenience that was caused to individuals there. So I, I think that um, what we have to do is that our goal should be to define uh, this legislation in a way that is very clear and very meaningful to our constituents and to policy makers. And I know Mr. Stearns talked about uh, FTC control and authority. And um, some people believe that we should not give the FTC uh, the control to make the policy, specifically the um, FTC with the rulemaking process and having the ability to set what is personally identified information is a very powerful tool. And there are many that think we should define that in law and not give it to the FTC. So I want to stay with this. I want you to define for me, just go down the tick list of as, a, uh, as making rules what you would put, sequence what would be personally identified information, how you would sequence that in the rulemaking authority. I think the, the touchstone here is information that can be uniquely tied to an individual. I'm afraid that I just can't rattle off a list here, but my staff is very happy to work with you to articulate in more specific terms. But the, the, again, the key would be information that can then be used to identify someone. And I believe it would be broader than the definition that it's currently used in the draft bill. Okay, what I would like for you all to do then to, is to submit that to us in writing because I think this is an area where we're going to need to focus, uh, put some attention on what this is. Who owns that online presence is uh, becoming more important to our constituents and we hear from them daily on the privacy issue, on the data searching, the data selling, uh, all of these issues that are becoming intertwined, even with the piracy issue and the intertwining that is there. So uh, to say a unique tie uh, may be a simple, concise answer to give, but it does not provide the depth that we're going to, um, that we're going to need to and have as we go through this. So I would ask you to do that. Okay. Um, the chair talked about declaring war on identity theft and online fraud, and I think she is exactly right on this. Uh, because, and I agree with her on, on this, and our constituents look at this virtual marketplace that is out there, and they look at the relationship they have had with brick and mortar retails and uh, entities, and then with click and uh, mortar businesses and also virtual. So let's talk about people who have become the, uh, the victim of identity theft. What services do you think should be made available to them? People realize a free credit report doesn't cut it. Credit monitoring doesn't cut it. So tell me what you think 
for those that have been harmed by identity theft? What services should be available for them? I, I do think that credit monitoring is an important aspect of the protection, but I also think it's incumbent to, that what the consumer will need to do is to be very vigilant, monitoring all of their financial accounts, monitoring their billing statements, and if they see anything So the personal is, is responsibility risk. aspect. That's an, that's an element of it, and we provide um, guidance to consumers about what they um, ought to do and the steps that so they So you see to the FTC's role more as providing guidance on that? In terms of consumer education is a, is a significant piece of what okay. the FTC does, and we do provide information to consumers, um, helping them take steps if their, for instance, identity has been stolen or there's a risk of that, what steps they can take to protect themselves. Okay, let me ask you one other thing. The bill that we're considering, should it apply to government systems? Um, this, uh, the, the bill should apply to commercial activity. That's the jurisdiction that the FTC has to commercial entities. So that's the scope of, of our jurisdiction. And you don't think we should apply it to government entities? It's an area that's outside the scope of, of what the FTC does. I respect that answer. Thank you very much. Yield back. Thank the gentlelady very much. And with that, we've concluded the first panel. We want to thank our witness very much for her in-depth and very thoughtful answers today. Uh, and say to the audience, we're going to take a five-minute break while we reseat the second panel, but to remind people that there is an overflow room in 2123 for anybody who would prefer to sit rather than stand. So again, uh, Commissioner Ramirez, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. See you all in five minutes. You did a terrific job. <laughs> no, you did. I sent a message. It didn't feel that way. What? It didn't feel that way. Oh, you, no, you did.
All right, if the subcommittee could come to order once again. If the uh, gentlemen in the corners could please uh, take your seats. On our second panel, we have four witnesses who are deeply engaged on the issue of cybersecurity. Testifying are Jason Goldman, Telecommunications and E-Commerce Counsel for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Robert Holliman, President and CEO of the Business Software Alliance, Stuart Pratt, President and CEO of the Consumer Data Industry Association, and Mark Rottenberg, Executive Director for the Electronic Privacy Information Center. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you'll each be recognized for five minutes to help you keep track of the time. There's a time clock uh, in front of you, and green, red, yellow, you know what they mean. Yellow means one minute to, to get to the uh, conclusion of your testimony. So at this point in time, we are going to recognize Mr. Goldman for five minutes, and please remember to turn your microphone on and bring it close to your mouth. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairwoman, uh, Chairwoman Bona Mack, uh, Ranking Member Butterfield, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee. I am Jason Goldman, Telecommunications and E-Commerce Counsel at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest federation, business federation, representing the interest of more than three million businesses and organizations of every size, sector, and region. On behalf of the Chamber and its members, I thank you for the opportunity to testify here today regarding the discussion draft of the Safe Data Act. We live in an information economy. Today, Chamber members of all shapes and sizes communicate with employees, existing customers, potential customers, and business partners around the world. They use data to spur sales and job growth, enhance productivity, enable cost savings, and improve efficiency. Global and U.S. data usage are skyrocketing. In today's tough economy, businesses depend more than ever on having beneficial and trusted relationships with their customers. Therefore, there is no question that protecting sensitive customer information should be a priority for all businesses that collect and store this data, and that customers deserve to be promptly notified if a security breach has put them at risk of identity theft, fraud, or other harm. The Chamber supports the enactment of meaningful federal data security legislation that would implement national data security standards to protect against the unauthorized access to sensitive personal information about businesses, customers, and breach notification requirements to notify customers when a significant risk to them may result from a security breach. At the same time, the Chamber urges policymakers to ensure that any legislation in this area does not hinder innovation and beneficial uses of data. The Chamber appreciates the willingness of the subcommittee to work with us on legislation aimed at accomplishing this goal. Uh, the Chamber only recently got this text of the Safe Data Act, uh, so our comments are based on our initial read and may change as we continue to vet the bill through our membership. Um, the United States has a national economy, and almost every state has enacted various data security and breach notifications, or breach provisions, many of which, many of which differ from one another in, in material ways. This patchwork of state laws not only makes compliance difficult for businesses, but can also create confusion for customers who receive notices from many sources. The Chamber supports the preemption of state information security and related liability laws to create a national uniform standard that will create regulatory certainty and minimize compliance costs for businesses that operate in multiple states. The Chamber has long advocated for a notice requirement that avoids the dangers of notification. As was discussed in the, in the previous panel, um, the Chamber worries that if needlessly alarmed, uh, customers may take actions that are not warranted and waste their time. Alternatively, more worrisome, Customers that are flooded by these notices may be falsely lulled in inactivity and not take proper action when the risk is justified. Uh, therefore, the Chamber is pleased that the draft bill recognizes that the notification should be based on risk of harm, not just on the mere fact that data breach occurred. Um, the Chamber agrees that notification of breach is not necessary where the data has been rendered unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable by, uh, by different methods such as um, encryption, redaction, or access controls. Uh, the Chamber also recommends the inclusion of a threshold number of individuals requiring notification that would trigger notification to the FTC. Uh, the Chamber agrees that consumers should be notified in a timely manner after the occurrence of a reportable breach. However, given the complexities of dealing with the a data breach, the Chamber recommends that the draft be modified to allow companies a reasonable amount of time to notify consumers rather than a specific time frame. Uh, furthermore, to catch cyber crooks and other criminals as well as to ensure that the safety of our nation, the Chamber supports the revisions in the draft bill uh, permitting delay of notification for law enforcement and national security purposes. 
um, along with that, the chamber recommends inclusion of language in the bill that would identify which specific agencies um, would uh, trigger that exception or would have uh, be able to enact that exemption. Uh, and regarding liability, the chamber is um, concerned about the application of a daily fine as it relates to the bill's uh, security requirements. If any, if any entity is found liable for violating the data minimization requirement, um, is every day if the entity maintains records uh, that should have been destroyed throughout all the databases a multiplier penalty? Um, the chamber appreciates the, uh, the revisions on the data broker provisions um, that were discussed in the, in the panel earlier. Um, on enforcement, the chamber is uh, concerned about enabling state attorneys general to impose 50 different uh, enforcement regimes that will undermine the uniformity of this act and make compliance exceedingly difficult. At the very least, the draft bill should curtail the ability of state attorneys general to, unify, to utilize private outside contingency attorneys to enforce this act or to litigate claims on behalf of their constituents. Uh, also, the chamber appreciates the, uh, the uh, tech neutral provision in the, in the act that says the FCC, FTC should implement it in a tech neutral manner. And, uh, and last, the, uh, the chamber does appreciate the, uh, the, the inclusion of a uh, prohibition of the pr no prior right of action. And with that, uh, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Mr. Holliman, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Bono, Mack, Mr. Butterfield, members of the committee, Business Software Alliance strongly supports the enactment of a national data security and data breach notification law. We believe that that is important to build trust and confidence in the digital economy. This is now the fourth Congress to consider data breach legislation, and we're grateful for the opportunity that we've had to work with the members of this committee to advance a bill. The time to act is now. The need is clear, as are the solutions. DSA endorses the key elements of the Safe Data Act that are before us today. We support requiring organizations that hold sensitive personal information to implement reasonable security procedures. And the draft bill takes into account an organization's size, the scope of its activities, and the costs involved. We support creating incentives to adopt strong security measures. The draft bill will promote the use of technologies, such as encryption, which render data unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable to thieves if they manage to steal it. We support an approach that avoids unnecessarily alarming or confusing consumers, and the draft bill accomplishes that by only requiring notification when there is a risk of identity theft, fraud, or unlawful activity. Finally, we support the bill's establishment of a uniform national framework with federal enforcement, preempting today's patchwork of state laws. We hear about new data breaches almost daily. One group, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse, has recorded more than 2,500 of them since 2005, involving more than 530 million individual records. In many cases, these records include data that are useful to identify um, individuals uh, and then exploited by thieves, such as Social Security, credit card, or driver's license numbers. Surveys indicate that these breaches are causing consumers to question the security of online transactions, and that is especially troubling because we are in the middle of an exciting new wave of innovation with the emergence of cloud computing. Cloud computing offers tremendous new opportunities for economic growth and efficiency. It allows businesses and organizations to reinvent their back office operations and will give users access to their data and services from any device, uh, whether they're at home, at the office, or on the road. We cannot allow breaches to erode confidence in the cloud environment or the internet economy. And for years, BSA members have been working hard to protect data for cyber criminal, criminals. BSA members are leaders in providing new security solutions and themselves invest in reducing vulnerabilities and protecting the integrity of their technology. BSA members are developing cutting-edge security solutions that are employed by businesses and consumers to defend against the evolving and the very real threats. And BSA has led the fight against the use of illegal software, not only because it drains revenues from American companies, but also because pirated software 
commonly includes malicious computer code that hackers and other criminals use to steal data. Importantly, BSA members are at the forefront of the cloud revolution, which creates new opportunities to better store data behind strong security walls. As this committee understands, Congress also has a responsibility. In the absence of a national law, states have enacted their own data breach notification requirements. Unfortunately, this has resulted in inconsistency that is unwieldy for business and confusing for consumers. We need a uniform national framework that better protects consumers and also, as this bill does, promotes effective security measures. I testified before this committee two years ago about the need for a national data breach law. Since then, another 250 million sensitive records have been breached. Madam Chairman, I commend you and your colleagues for drafting this bill. I urge Congress to pass a federal data breach law this year, and the BSA, BSA and I look forward to working with you and members of this committee to make that a reality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Holliman. Mr. Pratt, you're recognized for your five minutes. Madam Chairman, Ranking Member Butterfield, and members of the subcommittee, my name is Stuart Excuse Pratt. Excuse me, is that microphone on? It is, but we'll pull it closer. Thank you. Madam Chairman, is it working? Is it, if the light is on, I can't light necessarily on. tell, but the people in the back uh, really care that they can hear well. I'm President and CEO of the Consumer Data Industry Association. We appreciate the opportunity to testify today. For more than a decade, CDI has been on record as supporting the enactment of a uniform federal standard for both security of sensitive personal information and notification of consumers where there is a significant risk of identity theft. With this in mind, we applaud the focus of this hearing. Your committee's leadership is key to finding the right path forward. CDI's members support the proactive approach you have taken by circulating a discussion draft in order to build the much-needed consensus. It is the right step to take. You've asked us to comment on the discussion draft uh, known as the SAFE Act or SAFE Data Act. So first, CDI is very encouraged by the essential structure of the draft bill. Risks to sensitive consumer data are best addressed with two key pillars. First, sensitive personal data must be secure. The draft proposal appropriately empowers the Federal Trade Commission to write scalable regulations relative to data security, much as the FTC and bank agencies have done for financial institutions governed by the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. CDI members support this approach. Second, consumers must be notified when sensitive personal information about them has been lost or stolen. Again, our members support notification where, for example, there is a significant risk of harm for the consumer, such as the likelihood of becoming a victim of the crime of identity theft. Within these two key pillars are many provisions which are well thought out and deserve to be highlighted. For example, the discussion draft establishes strong incentives for U.S. businesses to adopt strategies to reduce risks by rendering data unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable. These incentives are appropriately technology neutral and thus will spur innovation in the design of systems that will ultimately protect data about consumers. The draft properly includes a risk-based trigger for determining when a notice must be sent, which ensures that we as consumers receive relevant and timely notices rather than a deluge of notices through which we need to sift to find the one that is meaningful. While the draft urges speedy notification of consumers, it acknowledges the need for law enforcement to engage with the private sector and in some cases to delay such notices, but not to allow delays that are unduly long. We are pleased that the draft's proposal solves the problem of overlapping laws with regard to data security, fully exempting persons who are subject to the data security requirements of Title V of the Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act ensures that CDIA members, both large and small, are in the very best position to successfully comply with the law and most importantly, to be successful in securing sensitive personal information about consumers. We encourage the committee to adopt a similar subject to standard with regard to persons who are already held accountable for data breach notification duties other under federal laws, regulations, or agency guidance. Ensuring a truly uniform national standard for both data breach notification and data security is essential to the success of the draft proposal. To this end, we applaud the inclusion of Section 6. As the committee continues to refine the discussion draft, we encourage it to consider a subject matter approach to preemption to ensure that the standard is truly uniform. Regarding the content of notices, let me make just a couple of points. First, we thank you for the inclusion of language in Section 3E, which makes it clear that the person who experienced the breach and who is notifying consumers is the one who pays for the credit reports to which the consumer is entitled. 
Second, for the sake of consumers, we request that the bill be amended to require those who are sending out breach notices to more than 5,000 individuals to notify consumer reporting agencies in advance so that our members can appropriately prepare to handle the spike in volume. Further, all persons issuing notices must verify the accuracy of the con contact information included. Our members have at times discovered that breach notices issued by others had incorrect toll-free numbers listed, which is a disservice to consumers. The term the terms of definitions, in terms of definitions, we are glad that Section 57A establishes a definition for the term personal information. Having a definition is clearly necessary to ensure that all persons affected by the scope of the bill understand the type of data which must be protected. Section 57B properly excludes public records from that definition. Our members are concerned with the inclusion of Section 57C, which allows the FTC to alter the definition. We believe the definition as proposed is adequate and should be set by the Congress. In closing, let me congratulate you on a very strong discussion draft that is unencumbered by ancillary issues. The committee is on the right track, and we look forward to supporting its efforts to protect consumers' sensitive personal information. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pratt. Uh, Mr. Rottenberg, five minutes. Thank you. information uh, improperly accessed. A hundred million users of the PlayStation Network also had information improperly accessed. And if I can make an additional point for you this morning, these problems are going to get worse. We are moving more of our personal data from our laptops, our devices, and our desktop computers into the cloud where they can be more easily accessed by others. You are going to hear more and more about security breaches. You are also going to learn that the attacks are becoming more sophisticated. Not only do we have to contend with phishing, which seek to obtain sensitive personal data, we now have to contend with what's called spear phishing, which means identifying particular users and using some information about them, such as their home address, to get additional information that makes possible identity theft, uh, financial fraud, and so forth. So at the outset, my sense would be that given the fact that the House last year had passed a strong measure, the problems are getting worse and likely to continue to do so, I would have started there and tried to figure out how to, how to improve that bill. And in that spirit, I actually wanted to commend you for incorporating the data minimization provision in the draft bill. I think this is a very important uh, safeguard that not only limits uh, the risk at the outset by telling companies, you know, really think if you need to have social security numbers on health club uh, members, for example, because if you lose control of that information, you've created a risk. So you reduce the risk at the outset, but in the circumstances where the information is improperly accessed, there's less exposure to customers. So that's also an important safeguard, and I'm very glad to see that incorporated um, in the draft measure that you circulated, as well as the effort to reduce the time period for notification. Because one of the other things that we've learned based on the Citibank experience and the Sony experience is not surprising. These companies are reluctant to notify their customers when they have a problem. And that's why legislation is so important for companies to tell customers that there is a problem and that you're going to need to act on this information. So I think the fact that you have limited that time period is very important. Now, in my written testimony, I made some additional suggestions, and I'll try to highlight the key points in particular about questions that have been raised by the members during the earlier part of this hearing with uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Ramirez. I, I noted, for example, Dr. Cassidy had asked this question, well, why should we have a public uh, information uh, 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 you know, requirement if that data is already out there? Can't we kind of put that in a separate category and not have to notify people? And I think the answer is obvious. There is a big difference between someone breaking into a database to get someone's home address and someone finding the home address in a publicly accessible file. And the reason, of course, is that there's intent behind the break-in to go after the person whose home address has been obtained. And the fact that it might be accessible somewhere else should hardly make people feel good about the fact that it can be characterized as public information. 
So I would take away that exception that says that somehow companies get a free pass if it's information that can be obtained somewhere else. Um, therefore, they don't have to worry about people breaking in who, who get access to it. I think the home address information makes obvious the problem. There's been some discussion about how do we um, uh, define personally identifiable information. It's a very difficult problem. It comes up in almost every privacy bill. Um, I think a very good starting point is to, to say simply personally identifiable information is information that identifies or could identify a person and then include by way of illustration, uh, including but not limited to many of the provisions you have in your bill. So it is a social security number, it is a bank account number, it is a person's name, it is a home address. But it could also be an IP address. In other words, the fixed internet address associated with their laptop or their mobile device. That very well could be personally identifiable information. Their Facebook user ID could also be personally identifiable information. In fact, that's exactly what contributed to one of the concerns about app access to Facebook-based information. On this critical question of preemption, I completely understand uh, why my colleagues at this table would favor national standard. It's quite sensible from their perspective. But I would urge you to look very closely at some of these strong state measures that would be effectively overwritten if a weak federal standard is established. Those bills are important. And even in states like California, where they thought they had it right the first time on financial data, they had to come back later and deal with medical breach uh, notification as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I apologize that I did not pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Mr. Rotenberg, yes, correct? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, as a student of how John Dingle does his questioning, I'm going to try this myself and recognize myself for the first uh, five minutes with a yes or no required out of each of you, and we can go down the line starting with Mr. Goldman uh, and around and around. So yes or no, um, Mr. Goldman. Is the existence of so many state standards an impediment to faster consumer notification? Uh, yes. 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 Should not be. Is preemption necessary to speed up the consumer notification? Yes. 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 No. Would a single federal standard lessen the risk of over-notification and decrease the number of unnecessary notices sent every year? Yes. 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 No. Do you think consumers can become desensitized to risk if they receive too many notifications? Yes. 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 Do you believe there's a problem with over-notification that can adversely affect consumers, even if it may be erring on the side of caution for the consumer's benefit? Yes. 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 No. Do businesses ever err on the side of notifying consumers, even if they may not be required to do so, because waiting through 46 plus standards is too difficult or time consuming? Yes. 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 I don't know. Should companies who no longer need it keep sensitive information such as credit card numbers or dates of birth in perpetuity? Can you repeat the question, sorry? Should companies who no longer need it keep sensitive information such as credit card numbers or dates of birth in perpetuity? Uh, it depends is not an answer, right? <laughs> um, no. Say no. No? No. No. Should every data breach trigger a notice to consumers? Um, no. 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 Yes. Should information made available by federal, state, or local governments in accordance with the law and thus otherwise be publicly available be considered personal information? Uh, no. We've not taken position on that. No. Yes. Should the FTC have the ability to modify the definition of PII? No. Let's say our answer would be yes. No. Yes. Should entities that are governed by explicit information uh, security and breach notification requirements of other federal laws enforced by other agencies also be subject to FTC enforcement under this draft? No. 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 Yes. Should all entities, regardless of their size or the scope of personal data they hold, be subject to the same data security requirement rules for Section 2 of this legislation? No. We've not taken a position on that. No. No. 
Thank you. And do you believe regulation of the collection and use of data is a data security issue? Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Do you think encrypted data that is breached should require notification? No. 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 Yes. And lastly, should state attorneys general have the ability to enforce this law? No. <coughs> yes. No position. Yes. Is your organization a nonprofit organization? Yes. 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 Does your organi organization maintain personal information of the sort that would be covered by this bill? I don't know. Yes, for our employees. Yes. Yes. Do you agree with the proposal to allow the FTC to regulate in this area? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. You, and now just the wild card to throw it out. Do you believe political campaigns should be con covered as well? Oh, uh, no, no comment. <laughs> and consider it. No position. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, that went rather well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Goldman, you suggest uh, changing the time frame from 48 hours to a reasonable time frame would guard against over-notification and consumer overreaction. If notification is tied to risk of harm, how do we risk over-notification? I think, I think it comes down to, again, it is, it's, it's over, it, you know, we're, we're extremely concerned about over-notification. And specifically, it depends what kind of the breach is. I mean, this is one of the things I'm talk I mentioned in my testimony, is that if you, for example, have a, um, an employee steal information from another employee, that's sort of a one-on-one -on -one breach. So does that trigger the whole breach mechanism that is included as part of this? So I think it, you know, it, sort of, it sort of depends on a case-by-case on a -case basis, that is what I would say. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Uh, Rotenberg, you recommend that Congress define PII and not permit the FTC to further amend that definition. I mean, excuse me, Mr. Pratt, this question is for you. Uh, but is it wise to lock anything into stone when it comes to technology? Could there be advances in technology that would enable seemingly innocuous pieces of information to become the tool of fraudsters? As an industry that deals with a lot of that information that's sensitive and as an industry that secures that information today, I mean, we're comfortable with the structure that you have in place. We do think it encompasses the types of data that expose consumers to a degree of risk. And I think even some of the examples that Mr. Rotenberg has given, uh, we would disagree with those, that those are necessarily new and different risks that might have to be accounted for subsequently. So we still stand by the position that uh, we believe that Congress should work out its definition and give businesses uh, a stable uh, marketplace in which to then compete and build the products and services. Thank you. My time has expired. I look forward to a second round of questioning and now recognize Mr. Butterfield for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Information brokers possess huge data profiles on a staggering number of Americans, nearly all of them, uh, nearly all of whom do no business with these brokers. Uh, these brokers invest time and money to uncover personal details, and without knowledge or consent, they sell this information to the highest bidder. It appears that American consumers have no free market method of showing disapproval. If they feel their personal information is being misused or to correct any inaccuracies in the profiles, it is in situations like these where it becomes prudent to enact laws that empower consumers giving them the tools they need to control their personal data. Uh, Mr. Rotenberg, do you believe, sir, that consumers should be able to access the information that brokers uh, hold about them uh, upon their request? Yes, I do, Mr. Butterfield, and, and I do so for precisely the reason that you explained, which is that there's no one-to-one -one relationship between the consumer and the information broker. They're a third party, which means the consumer actually doesn't otherwise know what information they would have. When a broker possesses information, who actually owns that data? Well, of course, the broker would claim that they do, but what they do with the data has an enormous impact on the individual. It can determine employment. It can determine whether they get an apartment, a federal contract. A whole range of activity in the United States is today deeply impacted by the information that information brokers have about us they make available to others. Do you believe that consumers should be able to dispute inaccurate information that brokers hold on them? Yes, I do. The information brokers have become the modern-day equivalent of the credit reporting agency. 
and Congress figured out 40 years ago that credit reporting agencies were holding financial reports on consumers that impacted their ability to get loans and start businesses. Information brokers are playing a similar role today. Individuals should have a right to dispute what's in that record. H.R. 2221, the data security bill approved by the House last Congress that uh, Mr. Rush and others had their fingerprints on, uh, but which the Senate failed to act, contained various requirements on how information brokers must interact with consumers uh, seeking to access their personal information or resolve a dispute about its accuracy or misuse. In lieu of complying with these requirements, brokers were given an alternative procedure that they could follow, uh, namely providing inf individuals with the option to completely opt out of having their personal info used for marketing purposes. Neither the special requirements on information brokers nor the alternative opt-out procedure are included in the Republican discussion draft as we can discern. Uh, in the absence of a federal law mandating simple opt-out procedures, brokers have generally not provided them. However, in a perverse turn, the data broker Re U.S. Search Incorporated uh, recently tried to fill the gap by telling consumers that for $10 it would lock their records so that others could not see them or buy them. The FTC soon found this promise was entirely false. In March, the Commission reached a settlement where the company agreed to refund all fees charged and avoid misrepresentations in the future. Again, Mr. Rodenberg, do you believe that it is currently too difficult for consumers to opt out of information broker databases? Yes, I do, Mr. Butterfield. I think this is an area where there needs to be legislative safeguards. Can you discuss how difficult it is to remove one's information from a broker's database compared to those of retailers? Well, the broker uh, business model relies, of course, on the collection of detailed information about consumers without their knowledge. It's not the consumers providing the information. And that information gains commercial value as it's shared with more third parties. Excuse the consumer me. has no ability to interact to limit those transactions. Sure. So the simple answer to your question is it's very difficult. It's very difficult, I think, for consumers to play any meaningful role in what information brokers do with the information yeah, about I them. I see your point. And let me just uh, throw it over to the chairman and yield I to her. I appreciate yes. the gentleman yielding to me very much at a strange time. I just want to reiterate to the panel and to the, in the subcommittee that we are also looking at privacy and to the d to degree that we can separate the privacy debate from the data breach debate at all will be helpful uh, for us as lawmakers to understand that the two, although very similar in this case, they might be different. So I just want to throw that out for you all to point out when you see it as a privacy issue beyond data breach. That would be helpful. That's a very important distinction, and I thank the chairman for, for making that comment. My time has expired. I, I yield back. <clears throat> Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Butterfield. Uh, and the Chair is happy to recognize Mr. Stearns for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Goldman, uh, the ch Chair Lady talked about this uh, 48 hours breach. Uh, and, Mr. Goldman, you'd indicate that uh, you have more pr preference for a um, reasonable, I think you indicated. Um, Correct. Are there cases where, for example, we could move the 48 hours to, let's say, 96 or 72 that you would feel more comfortable with rather than 48 hours? Or is it a fundamental idea in your mind that every company is different? One's a small company, one's a large company. The situation in which it occurs is different. So, in fact, to put a mandate of 48 hours uh, as a time frame might not be ap applicable. So maybe you might want to explore that. Sure. Uh, I mean, from talking to some of our members that have experienced, unfortunately, some of these breaches, uh, you know, they're, they're talking as it can take, you know, anywhere from a few days to even 100 days or more to, you know, to get to the bottom of it. So, I mean, that's why we're very leery of putting a time frame on it. Um, you know, I guess the HR 2221 uh, include, I think, a 60-day time frame. I don't think we generally support that bill, but I don't think we fully vetted that 60-day requirement. So I'd have to, like, I have to get back to you on that. But I think generally we are concerned about uh, making sure the businesses have the ability to re properly re react without uh, having that time frame uh, guide their actions. Um, can you give me a specific example from one of your members where a 48-hour uh, time frame would be harmful or very difficult to, to accomplish? 
Well, I think from reading the press reports, I'll speak to this. They, um, you know, and in, in in one of the pr cases that have recently occurred, um, the company said originally said that the credit card data was compromised, and it turns out that credit card data was not compromised. So, you, so it took them some time to figure it out. It took them time, but still, they, in, in the meantime, they notified and told customers that their credit card data was, was compromised. So in the meantime, you have customers canceling their credit cards, going through the inconvenience of canceling their credit card and having to get new credit cards. And it's even more an inconvenience if you have monthly fees you know, automatically charged to your credit card because then you have to contact those vendors, and you know, it just gets very complicated. So I think you know, it, for the consumer point of view, I'd like to make sure before I go through that hassle that, that I actually have to. And so when you use, a, when you use the uh, language reasonable time period, that gives them that flexibility. I would say so. Okay. And Mr. Rottenberg, you don't agree with this. As I understand it, you think the 48 hours, but based upon what Mr. Goldman said, is there a possibility that there are situations where a company, particularly you mentioned this credit card company, that if they go out and scare all their members within this 24 or 48 hour period, these people all start canceling their credit cards, when action, actually, when they do the investigation, there was not a breach. Uh, well, is that a good example, or do yeah, you think that his it, example if is... If I may clarify, uh, Congressman, not only do I stay by the 48-hour rule, I actually disagree uh, with the characterization of your first witness. I know a fair amount about what happened in this Citigroup uh, breach matter. Uh, in fact, there was credit card information disclosed. It was account holder name information, and it was the account number information. Now, it was not the security code, and it was not the expiration number. And the conclusion was drawn that, therefore, the risk was somewhat, somewhat less okay. than they initially thought. But the risk was very real, and it was important but, for but people to But wouldn't you notify. also agree with what Mr. Goldman says, that every company is different, and sometimes this breach, when they're going to look at perhaps thousands and millions right. and tens of thousands, that it's possible that they can't do it in 48 hours, I, and there I, might be some idea, maybe not 48, 96, there might be a reasonable time period. Now, wouldn't you agree on that? I appreciate the difficulty, and there's no doubt there's a real burden on companies when they have to notify customers, and they're understandably reluctant to. Okay. But there is a problem, and I don't think we can diminish the problem okay. by... I want to go on. I have another um, question. Just to clarify, I was not referring to the Citibank, just to clarify. Okay. Um, also in the bill, uh, it provides the FTC broad authority to... Def it, it uh, uh, talked about personal identifiable information, and we had some questions on that. Um, is there any any of you concerned about the definition of personal identifiable information? Can a company adequately understand that definition so that they can actually conclude when it comes to data minimization what they should take out? I, I guess my question is, Mr. Goldman, um, are you concerned about the FTC and how they interpret these terms and what impact the legislation would have dealing with data minimization? Uh, yes, we are concerned about the ability of the FTC to expand its definition of uh, PII means. Um, you know, I think, we, we're def I think we're comfortable with the definition that's in the draft bill as is. Uh, we worried about the inclusion of, uh, of, 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 of um, internet protocol addresses. Uh, we worry about the inclusion of usernames. Um, so I think, yes, we are definitely worried about the, uh, the, the expansion, the possibility of expansion of authority. Okay. Thank and you, Madam Chair. Thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Mr. Rush for five minutes. I want to thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Holloman, you said in your testimony, and I hope that uh, I'm accurate in my paraphrasing it, uh, that security breach notifications should be required in instances where there's reasonable risk of identity theft fraud or un unlawful conduct. You suggest that these limits are needed to help reduce excessive notifications, which might lead to mass anxiety and panic among consumers. But, as Mr. Rottenberg uh, pointed out, phishing and spear phishing, which are two examples of fraud and, and unlawful conduct, are likely to result in most, if not all, instances of large-scale breaches. So shouldn't the scale of the breach be a dis dispositive factor in determining whether consumers ought to receive immediate notification? Thank you, Mr. Raj. Good question. I think that we, we believe that there should be a notification triggered when there's a significant risk of, 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 uh, of a harm. 
We think that the important provisions in this bill, however, are the ones that encourage industry to adopt security measures using encryption or other technologies that would render the information indecipherable or unreadable. And that that's actually, at the end of the day, the most important safeguard because that, when it's affected, if that information is obtained, but the, the criminal can't do anything with that information, then we believe that you should not have to notify consumers because it's that excessive notification that we believe raises consumers' concerns unnecessarily. And what the market should be doing is driving people to store data in unreadable format so that when breaches occur, and they will, the criminal can't do anything with that data. Do the other three witnesses uh, agree with that? Um, we strongly agree, though, that one of the and, – and this was true of your bill as well, Congressman, and that is uh, the incentive to render the data unusable is probably one of the most critical provisions of the current draft of the bill that you had passed last year. Uh, it's one that we focus on as an industry every day. It's the one that we take most seriously because the strong incentive is not to notify people that you have lost data, whether it's a criminal act or, or some other failing but to have protected it in the first place. I mean, that's always first. Right. Protect it in the first place. Right. Find the best technology to do it right. when the data is at rest, when the data is in transmission. Sure. That's really critical. Right. <coughs> Mr. Pratt, you, uh, you argued in your testimony for advance notice of a security breach, presumably, uh, presumably at the same time as when uh, notice is given to the FCC. Would such a model favor your members over other similar parties who don't make the definitional cut as, quote, uh, data broker, uh, end of quote? The, the reason we're requesting notice, and I'm not sure we're saying that it has to occur concurrent with uh, notification of law enforcement or the FTC, we're just simply, we have uh, call centers. And when a letter goes out and says, call the credit bureau and order a credit report, we have to make sure that we have the right staff. We have to make sure that we have the, the right pipes open for the online access or the telephonic access even the mail processing access. Mm -hmm. And we have normalized systems. We understand what our normal pattern is, but a very, very large data breach creates aberrant patterns, which creates spikes of activity. We just want to be able to serve the consumer and uh, ensure that they get the credit report that they want or ensure that the telephone is picked up on time, which is what they expect. So that really, that's mm -hmm. the reason why we're asking for that. All right. Uh, <clears throat> can any of the other witnesses conceive how such a model might impede the FCC's ability to investigate and enforce uh, under the law? Any other witnesses? Okay. All right, let me ask Mr. Rottenberg. Mr. Rottenberg, uh, can you please elaborate further on why you believe uh, this uh, definition of personal information is too narrow and why you believe it should be defined as information that, quote, identifies or could identify a particular person? In the well, I think the definition that I proposed followed uh, with examples, which are included in the bill, is common sense. Um, we think of personal information as information that identifies someone or could identify them, and then the examples are good. But I also know, uh, based on some of the recent experiences uh, with data breaches, that IP address uh, poses a risk because it can be personally identifiable. Uh, the Facebook user ID posed a risk uh, because it was user identifiable. So th the list helps people understand, but if the list is limited, I think we have a problem. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you, Mr. Rush. And the Chair recognizes Mr. Olson for five minutes. I thank the Chair, and I'd like to welcome the witnesses, and I really appreciate your perspectives on an issue which has only become more pervasive in the future just as Mr. Rotenberg eloquently stated in his opening statement. Uh, my first two questions are for you, Mr. Goldman. Um, what is the Chamber's view of the carve-out for entities already covered under Graham Leach Bliley? Is this an adequate, explicit carve-out? Um, you know, we didn't take a position on that in our testimony, um, but generally we have supported uh, carve-outs for entities that are already covered by other by other laws, so there's not duplicative laws, and they can figure out which agency they're, better re they're regulated under. Um, so, yes, that's, that's my answer. Okay, thank you for that answer. And uh, as currently drafted, the legislation stands for risk is a reasonable risk of harm. Uh, when I asked our 
witness on a previous panel, the FTC Commissioner, Ms. Ramirez, uh, she stated that the FTC thought that reasonable risk was the right standard because erring on the side of notification overrides uh, some sort of desensitization of the, of the public. And uh, could you elaborate on why the Chamber believes that consumers would be better off if the standard were changed to significant risk of harm? Sure. Uh, the Chamber does support a significant risk standard uh, because we are worried, I guess, as I stated in my opening comments, about, about two possibilities, where customers are, you know, over-notified and, and they just ignore it, and, you know, and then when a real risk occurs, they take, you know, they don't take any action, or they get, they get a notice and get, you know, and, and sort of react, you know, immediately, and so they cancel the credit card. So both, I mean, both on both extremes. So we prefer to have the significant risk standard. Thank you for that answer. And then I've got a round of questions just for all four of the witnesses. And we'll start off with you, Mr. Roteberg, just to give Mr. Goldman a break here. <laughs> but uh, if you or one of your member companies suffered from a security breach, how would the proposed Safe Data Act change their response, and how would it better help consumers avoid identity theft? Well, Congressman, we actually don't have member companies, but I will say that many of the elements that are currently in the bill we've actually tried to follow over the years. For example, this goal of data minimization we think is a very good way to protect people online, and we have for a number of years taken steps to limit the amount of personal information uh, that we collect. We collect the information we need to provide the services that we provide, but we don't collect excessive information. Thank you. Mr. Pratt? Um, our members are regulated first by, on the data breach notification side, by the 47 or 48 state statutes that are out there today. Uh, so uh, establishing a federal standard, I, I think, uh, w would give us an easier route to compliance, but we would be notifying consumers, just as we do today under those state statutes. And all of our, almost all of our members are financial institutions under the gramm leach Bliley Act. Uh, and so we're already complying with a data security regime, which is called the Safeguards Rule. And so uh, for most of our members, it would not be a remarkable change. And in fact, uh, even where our members have sensitive data that isn't otherwise regulated under GLB, for example, we build enterprise-wide data security. There's no reason to segregate out some data and treat it differently from other information. Uh, thank, so it's built enterprise-wide. Thank you for that answer. Uh, Mr. Holliman. I can't speak for any individual member company, but I can say that all of our companies are involved in trying to build greater security into their products and companies who provide tools to consumers and business to secure their environments. And certainly in supporting the concepts of this bill, we recognize that uh, they are ones that we would be subject to, and our members with that are completely uh, welcoming this legislation, again, with some fine tune tuning we'd like to see, but we think it's important to act and important to act this year. Thank you, sir. And finally, Mr. Goldman. Sure. With a uniform uh, national standard, it would make it a lot easier for our companies to comply versus the current situation of having to comply with, you know, 46, 47 state rules. Um, also, a lot of our companies are covered by, you know, other, other laws such as GLB or HIPAA. Well, thank you for that question. As a Navy guy, I can sum up, I think, all four of you that uh, we may not be hitting the bullseye, but we're hitting the target. And this, this <laughs> is a good Absolutely. piece of legislation. Finally, one question for the four of you. Uh, this proposed legislation would require an any entity co to conduct an assessment upon discovering a breach. Do you or one of your member companies, with all due apologies, Mr. Rotenberg, uh, already conduct assessments? I think I know the answer. And how would this requirement and its timing impact your ability, your company's abilities, your members, to resolve a security breach? I'll, t I'll take a pass. Um, I, I can't speak specifically because today those assessments would be dictated by the state laws that are out there, uh, which dictate different standards. Uh, that's one of the reasons why a national standard would be helpful uh, in terms of assessing a data breach risk. Uh, if, if I could just take one minute to speak to this GLB exception, it is important to have this exception because data security in this bill is a good idea, and, we, and our members are happy to live under a new data security regime for a part of our businesses which might not, might not otherwise be regulated. But if our members, small or large, are regulated by the gramm leach Bliley Act, we're only asking that we just operate in tandem, that we have the same data security provision under GLB. That's why that GLB exception is so important, though, because it means I don't have overlapping requirements between two different standards. Uh, and for small businesses in particular in our membership, that's an important thing because they don't necessarily have a general counsel on staff yes, who's sir. going to yep. advise them all the time. So yep. that's why that's so important. Well, thank you for that. Mr. Holliman. Yeah, because our members oftentimes provide technologies that are used to prevent breaches, we also have a lot of experience in helping identify breaches when they occur. And we know through that that the nature of the breach may differ, the amount of time to make the assessment may differ, 
and we support the provisions of the bill that are flexible depending on the nature of the breach and the size of the enterprise. Thank excuse you. And me, it, finally, Mr. Goldman. Excuse me. I need, need to move on. We're a minute over. So I'd I like to. I was going to yield back time that I didn't have, but I'll yield back the balance of my time. I, I <laughs> appreciate that very much, and I'm happy to recognize Mr. Kinzinger for five minutes. Well, thank you, Madam uh, Chairman. And I will say, as an Air Force guy, we hit the bullseye on the target every time. <laughs> so I think that's important to note. You don't want to go there, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I appreciate uh, all four of you and, and your assistance in helping us draft, I think, this very important piece of legislation. Some of this stuff has been touched on a little bit, but I want to I want to make sure we're, uh, you know, getting all the all the the questions answered that we need uh, for the three, Mr. Holliman, Pratt and, and Rottenberg. And then I guess, Mr. Goldman, if you want to jump in on this, too, let me ask um, in the current draft. If a company is unable to detect a breach over the course of several months due to insufficient security techniques, it does not appear that they necessarily face harsher penalties uh, for that. Do you believe that this legislation should include reasonable standards or methods for detecting breaches and penalties for those companies that fail to reach those standards? Well, I guess okay. we can start here. Yes, I think it's an excellent point. It would be a good, uh, a good change. Okay. And uh, we haven't actually asked our members that question, but maybe we could follow up with you and give you an answer to that. I would say in general, though, that the data security requirements that the FTC writes today are broad. They're enforced aggressively, uh, and they would imply that you have to have sufficient uh, security standards, not, not just simply to protect against, but to detect possible intrusions. And I know uh, even the association I run has stood up several major platforms where we've had intrusion detection systems that operate concurrently with other forms of protection of the data itself. So it's fairly common. And are those, for those kinds of systems, are they pretty foolproof? I mean, can they usually pretty? Well, I don't think anything's foolproof. Right, um, obviously. I mean, it's a moving target. I think that's very important for all of you. All of you all know this because of this, the cybersecurity issues that you've, you've probably learned a lot about in other hearings, and that is it is a moving target. So mm -hmm. they're always hitting targets, but they're different targets. Right, understood. Uh, but it's critical that, uh, and, and, and so when you look at these security requirements that are imposed on U.S. businesses, uh, they are written flexibly enough to account for ongoing assessment of risk. That's one of the key, key components. We're comfortable with that because we would agree, by the way, as well, it's a business necessity that we protect the data that we have, that we use the best technologies, that we look at new risks. Our members, for example, participate in the ISAC, which is the Information Sharing and Analysis Center that's operated by Treasury okay. in order to see what kinds of cybersecurity risks are out there. So we, we exchange information. In Mr. Holliman? Thank you. We, we certainly support the framework that this bill outlines. I'd want to get back to you on some of the specifics, particularly around newer concepts like minimization. I mean, I think they're important, but we have to canvas our members. We do believe that this bill is important because it not only deals with the issue of notification of breaches after the fact, but it puts in place obligations related to securing data. And again, those obligations, and when businesses do that up front, that is going to minimize the need for notifications, the excessive notifications. So that's an important addition to okay. the concept of this bill. Did you want to jump in on this? Oh, yeah, at all, yeah, real yeah. Quick? I mean, I'll have to go back to our members and ask. But I mean, in generally, you know, uh, the, our co you know, companies are very concerned about reputational harm. So they're going to take, you know, this for liability purposes and reputation right. purposes. They're going to take the best practices, you know, they can imagine. Understood. And just quickly, if you could just please. Very one point, sure. and that is, um, data security involves access control. Access control would almost inherently require, or at least implicitly require, some sort of intrusion detection system because otherwise you're not controlling access. Okay. So I think even if it's not expressly stated, it's built into the access control concept. Okay. And uh, as we talked about, we did, you know, getting into the boy who cried wolf issue, and, and if we could keep this real brief on for all of you, um, this draft could give a company an exceedingly long period of time to notify customers in a breach of high severity. Do you believe we should look into creating tier, kind of uh, tiers of risk? Um, so, you know, if, if there's a high level of risk for, a, for the consumer, that notification should be treated differently than that of a more moderate risk. I mean, should we have, you know, obviously different you, tiers on that? You no, know, Congressman, I think that's an attractive idea, but it would actually end up adding a layer of complexity to an already serious problem. And I think it's notable that when we have these extreme breach problems, you know, with Citibank and Sony and others, very sophisticated companies, large number of customers, here we are more than a month later and we still don't fully know the extent of the, of the harm. So while I appreciate the approach, I would try to go for a single simple standard. I think it's easier to manage. 
And if you just very quickly, because I got one more quick question in 20 seconds. I would have to get back to you on that. We don't have a position on that right now. Okay. We believe your issue can be best addressed by using the term significant risk in the bill. And then, uh, Mr. Goldman, do you believe that the legislation should more clearly define the size and scope of companies that must develop a security plan? Uh, yes. I mean, specifically, uh, and well, I mean, I'll go back to what I said before, was that when it talks about the um, – talking about the reason, you know, if, if, if you have a breach, you know, you, you, it depends on the size of the breach. And in terms of the company, yes. I mean, yeah, I mean, small businesses obviously are going to have much different uh, capabilities to respond than, than a larger size business, yes. Thank you. And I yield back my negative time. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <laughs> Thank you much, uh, very much, Mr. Kinziger. And gentlemen, I would like to uh, express the gratitude of all of the members of our subcommittee uh, for your time here today. And Thank you for your willingness to engage with us on this very important discussion. I think there's a lot of uh, great ideas and willingness to come together with a great bill. I want to reiterate again my desire for a bipartisan product and, and believe that Mr. Butterfield and I can accomplish that goal. I'm very hopeful for that. Uh, I would also like to say that I was hoping for a second round of questions, but time uh, has gotten the better of us here. So I know that I will have some further questions in writing to, to, to send to all of you. And I'd like to remind the members that they all have 10 business days to submit questions for the record and would ask the witnesses to please respond promptly to any questions they receive. So, again, as uh, the recent spate of high-profile, eye-popping data breaches point to the need uh, for new safeguards to better protect sensitive online consumer information, it is a huge challenge, and I know that we can get this done by working together. So thank you all very much for your time today. And, and with that, the hearing, the subcommittee uh, is adjourned. Thank you.